In Deutschland geht es gut, unsere Wirtschaft wächst und die Zahl der Beschäftigten bewegt sich auf Rekordniveau. Damit das auch so bleibt, müssen Politik und Wirtschaft miteinander im Gespräch bleiben. So wie auf der Kongressreihe Wirtschaftsgespräche der CDU-CSU-Bundestagsfraktion. Und wir sind jetzt an einer entscheidenden Stelle angelangt. Hier diskutieren regelmäßig Politiker mit hochrangigen Vertretern aus Industrie, Mittelstand und Wissenschaft. Es geht um Themen wie den Breitbandausbau, das selbstfahrende Auto, die Start-up-Finanzierung, Wirtschaft 4.0, TTIP oder die Auswirkungen der Digitalisierung auf den Arbeitsmarkt. Dieses Thema Wirtschaft in unserem Land ist eine der zentralsten Aufgaben. Und da haben wir in dieser Legislaturperiode mit der digitalen Agenda, glaube ich, einen richtigen Schwerpunkt gesetzt. Wir müssen jetzt die digitale Strategie europäisieren. Wir müssen natürlich erkennen, dass die Situation sich vollkommen verändert hat. Wir brauchen lebenslanges Lernen. Nicht nur die Industrie wird sich ändern, sondern auch unsere Dienstleistungsbranche ähm, in jedem mittelständischen Betrieb wird sich vieles ändern durch die Digitalisierung. Glasfaserausbau, 5G-Standard, das ist das, was wir machen müssen. Und das führt uns dann sehr schnell dazu, dass wir vor allen Dingen nicht nur in Deutschland das tun müssen, sondern wir müssen es in Europa tun. In der industriellen Fertigung schon längst eine Selbstverständlichkeit durchdringt die Digitalisierung mittlerweile alle gesellschaftlichen Bereiche. Selbst in der Landwirtschaft packt Kollege Computer mit an. Vom vollautomatischen Melkstand über Stallroboter bis hin zum satellitengestützten Mähdrescher. Also die Digitalisierung ist in der Landwirtschaft schon weit verbreitet. Aber wir sind noch nicht so weit, dass der Computer das Schwein streichelt. Das machen noch immer die Menschen. <lacht> Liebe Kolleginnen, Kollegs, Chairman Volker Kauder, Mr. von Bechtolsheim, I would like to welcome you with one of our conferences. We have a full hall, which shows that you are very much interested in this topic. It is a topic that is one of the main topics of the future. I think it is urgently necessary that we address the topic, that we conduct a series of talks um, we had it during this legislative term, and that we conclude by the topic of digitalization our future. It is good to see that we do not only have high level guests, thank you for having flown over from the United States, but that you participate to uh, become part of the debate. And at the end, the Federal Chancellor will address you. We've launched this series of conferences because we know that industry is the backbone of our country. Everything is well as long as industry is doing good. Without smoothly running industry, we don't have any tax earnings with which we afford our prosperity. We have 55.7% of our federal budget uh, earmarked for social matters. Maybe we did not spend enough on industry, and maybe we can improve that during the legislative term. Maybe we can do that uh, more easily if uh, the outcome of the elections is accordingly. One thing is clear, and it is a matter of concern to me, a number of reasons are so-called exogenous factors. We, as politicians, have no influence on that. Low interest rates, the exchange rate with, uh, with you and the US dollar, which extremely helps our exporting industry, and the structure of oil and gas prices. If you think of the oil price two, three years ago, or one, more than 100 euros per barrel, now it's uh, 45, which is a big difference. Ladies and gentlemen, we achieved quite a bit in the field of digitalization, but there's still a, some way to go. Digitalization does not mean that we have some digital television programs. It means in a full networking 
And that is something we've, we have to fully grasp. For the full networking, we need a fiber optics network, which actually deserves the name. I looked at the figures. In the broadband area, it's OECD figures, Japan and Korea, 70% of uh, fiber optics, OECD average is 18%. And what do you think how much Germany has? 1.3%. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a disaster, and we really have to address this issue. I made the audacious suggestion, I'm just uh, full aware of the fact that it will not be implemented, but still I would like to reiterate that. Why does the federal government need the sh to hold shares of telecom? It would be more reasonable to sell it at uh, 32 billion and to fully invest that into fiber optics that would achieve more lot than the dividends we, we get. I know that this is not very popular privatization, still not very popular in Germany, but it is necessary, and fiber optic expansion in particular. I'm delighted to have you all here as our guests today. I hope we have an interesting conference, and I would now like to announce Volker Kauder. Michael Fuchs, ladies and gentlemen. The idea of this conference originated in California last year when we visited the Silicon Valley. Many of you will have visited the Silicon Valley and found that we have to improve a lot on digitalization in Germany in order not to jeopardize the good starting position of our German industry. When I visited Silicon Valley, I believe that I met some totally crazy people who had a totally different idea of society and believe that they can, what they can implement. Digitalization is like discovering a new continent. No one knows what's ahead of us, but the opportunities are are far greater than the risks. And this, the part of the new world we already discovered gives an optimistic outlook. We have only recently started to debate the framework conditions of a new digital world. When we look at the Facebook Act, what can be published on such a platform, or what cannot, when we think of the free Wi-Fi, everything we will adopt during this week, may anyone go online in an anonymous matter, manner without sending any idea. I d and um, these circulations will not last for centuries. It is important to start knowing full well that during the next few week, uh, years we will have to amend them time and again. Printing was invented 500 years ago. The United States or America was discovered 500 years ago. The digital world is revolutionizing our world, and it has since the 1980s. However, the massive impact of the digital revolution surprised quite a few of us. For many companies, the digitalization has become a vital issue. There is no way around digitalization. Those acting too late or not acting at all will fail. The problem of communicating the relevance of this topic to society is linked to the terminology. We had several tests that people showing that people do not know what digitalization actually is. There's no emotion linked to it, and it doesn't say where people are individually concerned. And that is something we will have to think about. Digitalization takes place rapidly at lightning speed, and even if you're in front row, you have to keep up to it. Because, as Wolfgang Leonhardt said, revolution. Uh, will eat up its children, as we had with Commodore, Atari, and others. 
sehr gut. I remember well that I talked to the Fuji CEO in Japan. I asked him what does Fujifilm actually do at the moment and he said we do pharmaceuticals. And I said, well, Fujifilm is just a name. And he said, well, we also do a few cameras, but it's just a name. And all those who didn't understand that paper-based photos would not continue went under Kodak and others. We have our name, but we have an entirely new product. What we learned is that digitalization demands that we all continue to learn, that we do away with obsolete technology. You remember the um, typewriters and other obsolete technology. The compact disc is no longer and a bestseller, we now have cloud computing, monopolies grow and fall. Microsoft and Intel, the struggle of the EU Commission against Microsoft. Microsoft was not uh, restricted by politics, but by new companies that broke down the Microsoft monopoly. Innovations are often so fast that nation states and the European Union are not able to keep up with their legislation. I sometimes get the impression that when we talk about framework conditions and politics, we talk about something of the past. And that others look at us and wonder where we still stand. Products of digitalization change the world and the way we live, we shop, we work. The iPhone has existed for no more than 10 years. The world of the data has its uh, dark side. It's not only the dark net digital security and in industry ever more relevant, security, cybersecurity, you know what I'm talking about. And the attacks in recent day to German companies confirm that this is a relevant issue. The government has to keep up to these developments. The Federal Information Office and for Security in the Information Society is doing a good job. But I would like to give you a personal example. The federal government has launched a system to fend off hacker attacks, which works a lot better than the system of the German Bundestag. The majority of parliamentary groups in the German Bundestag, however, says that the federal government systems cannot be copied at the Bundestag because we control the federal government and we cannot take over the security system which makes the federal government control us. And you see what we are actually debating here, but we should really look at state of the art of technology and take over the system of the federal government for the Bundestag. Maybe we have different majorities on this issue during the next legislative term. So the state has to amend its policies time and again, although it is doing a good job already. We are seeing that venture capital is very relevant. We, we should promote venture capitalists. And we are well aware of that in the European Union, while having to debate this time and again with our coalition partner. Some um, debate same-sex marriage and not and do, uh, prefer to not look at the relevant issues of industry. What can digitization deliver? Those who believe that they have a blueprint for the industry and the society of the future are an ideologist or do not, are not aware of realities. It is our task to help you with digitalization and to pave the way for this future development. And understanding technological change is one of the main conditions, and that is why we have this series of conferences. We want to know what is going on, what is run, working and what is not working. We don't know when these changes will become relevant for society and for industry. The legislators, therefore, can only respond to what's going on. Politics has to remain alert without over-reglementing. We have to strike a balance between openness, happiness for new things, and the demand for safety and security. We have to see where the rules from the analogous world, 
continue to work when we need to adapt to the digital world. But we also have to recognize and that we have to provide more technology, for example, for rural areas where we have not yet reached our objective. There's a, currently a debate where they think whether everything needs the 5G standard on whether we do that uh, by a mobile phone only or do we need massive and expansive expansions into fiber optics. This is particularly relevant since many medium-sized companies are located in rural areas. We need more decisive action in future and broadband expansion is one of our main focal points. CDU-CSU parliamentary group sees a great opportunity for medium-sized companies and for industry as a whole. We want to facilitate Germany 4.0, but we will soon no longer be discussing industry 4.0, but what the Japanese do, they talk about uh, digital society. Everything will change. One thing is clear, Germany is not California and will never become California. People like Mr. Thiel from Germany say you don't even have the prerequisites to become like California. But he also told me a startup that has not reached a market capitalization of three billion in three years will have to shut down because it doesn't have a future. Looking to the Pacific coast has never been a mistake. And when I went to Silicon Valley, I found that there are approximately 60 to 70,000 Germans working there. Some of them could work in Germany. And I would thus like to hand over to Andreas von Bechholzheim who in 1975 went to the United States. I met him last year in Santa Clara. I am grateful that he uh, interrupted his vacation to come here to Germany to tell us about his view on digitalization. Thank you very much for being here. The floor is yours. Ich bin Deutsche und I am German. I still have a German passport. My mother tongue is German, but unfortunately I have to present this presentation in English because there are so many technical terms and I don't know um, how these words have been translated or whether they've been translated. Uh, the, the, the smartphone you know, that we take for granted today uh, really is just 10 years old. It was... Um, I think they just celebrated a 10 years birthday uh, two weeks ago when it started shipping. It was announced a little earlier. Um, but where we are today is there's billions of smartphones and tablets and millions and millions of servers in the cloud that allow any service to be available anytime to any consumer worldwide. And that just did not exist before. And this you know, obviously leads to rapid adoption of smartphones for e-commerce, buying things, but it really enables all kinds of new business models where companies can directly connect to consumers. They know where they are. They're in the shopping center. They're looking for a car. Whatever it is, you can completely change the way business interacts with the public. And I, I picked one example, which is actually, I, I guess it doesn't exist in Germany, Uber taxi service, which um, if you go to the US, uh, you know, skip the taxi, use Uber. It's a much better experience. It actually works so much better that I no longer take a, take a taxi. Um, and the way it works is, you know, you have your Uber app, you say, pick me up and I want to go there and the car shows up in a few minutes and you can see exactly where the car is to tell you how much it's going to cost and they bill your credit card. It's, it sounds simple enough. But um, would you believe that this one application, basically call it you know, digital ride sharing, has attracted 45 billion US dollars in venture capital worldwide over the last couple of years? 45 billion dollars just for interrupting the taxi industry. Now to put this in context, in Germany, the annual investment in startups is about four and a half billion plus minus. So this is equivalent of 10 years 
of startup investments in Germany just to disrupt ride sharing. Now, and maybe it's not the best investment. I'm not saying, you know, I would have invested there. Uh, and that this includes China and, and so on and so on. But the point of this slide is that if there is an industry that can be disrupted, there will be capital that will be invested to disrupt this industry, you know, across the world. And perhaps large in the US, maybe large in China now, there's no, there's no shortage of capital to go after big opportunities. And, and this is one example here. Now, what are the industries most at risk for disruption? I actually found this beautiful slide that says the highest one is media, which I think is true. Telecom is number two, financial services number three, retail, technology, insurance, nonprofits are ready for disruption. Uh, you know, education, healthcare, wealth management, industrial is actually a little lower, but basically a lot of industries that are very, very important to Germany are right on this list, and believe me or not, they will be disrupted. Now, the, the best uh, example for disruption, of course, is to point at the five uh, largest companies in this space, which include Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, and Microsoft, which also happen to be now the five uh, highest uh, capitalized companies worldwide. So these five companies, if you add them up in terms of all their aggregate shares, have a combined market value of almost three trillion, this is milliarden in Deutsch, trillions? Three trillion US dollars. Now, three trillion US dollars is more than the GDP of any EU country except Germany. It's greater than all but five of the world's stock markets, and it's roughly one-eighth of the entire US stock market. Now, it's a large number, okay? But the point is, this only happened in the last five years. Ten years ago, these companies were much smaller. The world's biggest companies were oil companies like Chevron and Exxon and whatever they're called. And of course, oil is cheaper now, so they came down. But basically, at least the stock market has decided that digital innovation is the future and they're putting a very high value on, on these kind of companies. Now, uh, what is common characteristics of these five companies? Well, they're all technology companies. You know, they may be selling advertising or you know, uh, other things, but they all fundamentally took advantage of technology interruption. They all are global companies. Uh, and they were all funded by Silicon Valley venture capital. And the average age of these companies is less than 25 years. You know, Google is started in 1998, less than 20 years. Facebook started 10 years ago. Uh, Apple kind of restarted in 1998. Uh, and Microsoft is actually the oldest. Now, in addition, four out of five of these companies were started by students who dropped out of school without any prior job experience. So what can we learn from this? Apparently, job experience doesn't matter a lot. But what does matter is, of course, to solve a big problem where you can go for the big market and you can go from zero to top five in the world in 25 years. I mean, this is sort of unheard of, but this is what happened in Silicon Valley. And I should add, you know, this, the, the wealth that was created here also, you know, largely went not just to the founders of these companies and the venture investors, but also to the employees of these companies. These five companies alone created at least $1 trillion US wealth for their combined, all of their employees, which is really unbelievable. Um, but bottom line, all of these companies use technology to disrupt the status quo. And <clears throat> going back to the, you know, larger uh, US public markets, the S&P 500, which is the 500 sort of largest US companies, the average lifespan, lifespan for a company to be in this index in 1955, the year I was born, was 61 years. Last year, 17 years. Um, and in the last 15 years, half of these companies actually disappeared. And maybe they got acquired or merged out, but you know, they're no longer here. In, German, in, uh, excuse me, in, in Europe, over the last 10 years, uh, the, I'm sorry, 10 years ago, there was roughly 17 of the world's biggest 50 companies in Europe. Today, it's seven, and three of them are in Switzerland. So why do big companies fail? Um, and this is one of my favorite quotes from my friend uh, Larry Page at uh, Google. Uh, the answer is they usually miss the future. It, it's really that simple, right? If you miss the future, you're not going to be part of it. And what you want to be is you want to disrupt, not to be disrupted, right? You want to innovate to drive growth. And this is true, by the way, for any company, any size. It's true for startups, it's true for middle-sized companies, it's true for the biggest companies. You are all at danger of being disrupted if you're not disrupting faster. 
Now, this is a conceptual diagram. I try to illustrate that we are not at the end of this disruption cycle, but at the very beginning. If you look at all the technology development in the last 50 years, it's impressive enough, but it's nothing like what we're going to see in the next 10 years, including in artificial intelligence. So I believe we're in the like teens of disruptions, like maybe 10, 15% compared to what's going to happen next. And you know, we're, we're very proud, of course, of all the advances in chips and software and computers and communication, and it's unbelievable. For example, Moore's law, you know, this Dr. Moore at Fairchild uh, 50 years ago, discovering Moore's law. You know, he's like, I've seen the future. Well, he predicted that the chips will double in density every other year, and this was completely true for the last basically 50 years, and is still going on. The ARPANET, or the internet, the first message was sent uh, uh, 1969. This was actually after the Americans landed the first astronauts on the moon. So. The modern packet network, it's hard to believe, is actually, they didn't have this when they did the moon landing. But back in 1977, which is just 40 years ago, there was 111 computers in the US connected to the ARPANET. Today, we have, I don't know how many billions, but it's just, you know, everything is connected to the internet. Um, AI is the one topic that has seen the most advance of any uh, category in the last couple of years. This applies to image recognition, speech recognition, language translation, you know, self-driving cars, uh, you know, basically anything. And I remember reading the story about the Google Cat. This was five years ago. So apparently they made this computer at Google watch cat videos on YouTube to figure out what a cat looks like. And after watching 20 million cat videos, the computer thought a cat looks like this, which kind of is what a cat looks like. But the, the improvements since are unbelievable. Basically, there's a, a, a database of 20 million images, and you can measure how accurate a computer can detect the image. Five years ago, the error rate was 25%, which is not very good, right? Then it dropped down to like 11%. Um, back in 14, the Google thing was 6 percent 14, 5%. Now, the human performance on this test is 5%, okay? Now it's down to 3.4. So computers, as of today, are better recognizing images than humans. Um, and you know, the, the human brain, of course, is an amazing thing. I don't need to tell you how amazing this is. But what's the most amazing to me is that when you recognize an object, it usually takes you maybe 100 milliseconds to detect, here's a cat. In 100 milliseconds, you only have about 10 neurons in your brain that actually fire because the neurons are very, very slow. So apparently the computer can, I'm sorry, the human can detect things with just 10 levels of neural activity very, very quickly. Now, the thesis at this point is that anything a human can do in, let's say, less than a second, a computer can probably do better than a human's in either now or very soon in the future. And this includes a, a wide, wide, wide range of applications. I just picked one here, like security monitoring. So obviously somebody's watching in this building all the security cameras to make sure nothing bad happens. Well, what it really is, is this is a continuous task of second by second recognition. There is this something on the image I should respond to. A computer could that almost certainly much better than a human even today, right? Making split second decisions. Um, this is another good example where a year ago uh, in a course about artificial intelligence at the University of Georgia, they uh, used a computer, this is an IBM Watson system, to answer the student questions, which normally goes to the you know, assistant of the class. And the way this works is the computer would answer any question where they had, the computer had a high confidence, like 97% confidence it had the right answer, and if it didn't know, it would send it to a human. Well, the funny part of the story is that the humans, that the students, didn't realize they were talking to a computer. They actually didn't figure it out until the end of the class, which <laughs> is hard to believe. So the Turing test has been met, at least in this example. And of course, one of the uh, other examples from Google, uh, the AlphaGo, which is the world champion in the game of Go. Go is the most complicated game. People thought for the longest time it's impossible for a computer to outdo the human champion. And as of last year, I guess, the AlphaGo program is the world champion. Now, the way this worked, by the way, is it, there was a lot of training involved. So first of all, the computer had to play all the existing games back, you know, that are already championship games. Then, as far as I understood this, they actually hired the European champion to train the computer. And then they made the computer play against itself. And then the computer was ready to take on the world champion and won. But the, the key thing about AI, and this is sort of, uh, you know, I, I got this from a good friend of mine at Google, but the, the simple summary is with AI, everything improves. 
You can literally improve any kind of process. And another way to think about this is that, you know, it's, a, it's transformational, perhaps like electrical, electricity 150 years ago, where electricity started the, you know, modern industrial age, you know, all, all the things we're taking for granted today didn't really exist before electricity, right? And the simple reality is, you know, smart machines, call them smart machines, you know, can process data faster than humans, they can certainly look at more data, they can pattern match better, they can create more alternatives than humans. In split seconds, they work 24 hours a day, they don't take vacations. It's, it's kind of scary, you know, the computers is uh, getting quite powerful and you know, there's marketing data that says it's a multi-billion dollar market for AI, but this is just a direct AI market. The real impact of AI is on any business process anywhere. It's really in the trillion kind of opportunity. And uh, this is sort of what makes me a little sad about Germany. So in the US, there have been now hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of AI startups funded by billions and billions of dollars of venture capital, of which, believe it or not, already 140 got acquired. <laughs> you know, 40 alone last year. And, um, and in Germany, I don't actually know one AI startup. You know, I mean, I'm not saying it's, you know, you have to be really smart to work in AI, but it's a great opportunity which is heavily invested in the US and not to be invested here. But not to scare you too much, um, you know, we're still far away from computers having emotions and understanding how people feel and what, what's called general AI, like a computer that is really like a human, that's, that's far in the future perhaps. But in specific domains, you know, where the computer has the data and, you know, has been trained and knows what to do, it's hard to build a computer these days. And there's clearly hundreds and hundreds of applications that are ripe for AI disruption, which will, needless to say, create a lot of winners and losers. Okay, now let me switch topics a little bit and just talk about venture capital. And of course, the US kind of has invented this, I don't know, 50 years ago. Uh, lots of venture capitalists on Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley. Almost all IT companies that we know today were funded by venture capital. And this has created a very, very big advantage for the US in Silicon Valley, where Silicon Valley has about 3 million people, 1% of the US population, attracting half of all US venture capital and a quarter of all venture capital worldwide. I mean, the statistic is off the chart. And, you know, the annual investment is around 50, 60, 7 billion dollars. Worldwide, it's probably 150. Uh, Germany is about five. Most of this is going into software. In fact, the vast majority of venture capital is going to in software and software-related technology. Biotech is very high, consumer things, entertainment, IT services, and so on. Now, the way this works, of course, in Silicon Valley is there's 10,000s of business plans. So a, a big venture firm like uh, Mark Andreessen's company gets literally 10,000 plans a year. They invite maybe 3% of these to actually come for a meeting and then invest in 30 of them. <laughs> it's, a, it's a Darwin down selection of the best ideas that get funded. Uh, this is a more specific uh, number. So annually, about 1,000 new companies get started in the US in terms of seed funding of which only roughly half make it beyond the first round of funding, so half already fail, if you want. Uh, surprisingly, 12% get acquired after the first stage, and so on and so on, but after six rounds, maybe close to 80% actually failed, and you know, failure is a given in this business, but 21% are acquired or had an exit, gone in public, and a few are still independent. Now, what makes companies succeed or fail? It's actually very, very simple. Uh, at least if you're sort of in the product space, which is if you, have to, if you build the right product at the right time for the right market and you have the right amount of funding and the right team, you will actually typically succeed. On the other hand, if it's the wrong product that's too late or too early, wrong market, you don't have enough money or lack of people, you know, you'll fail. Now, to me, and, and irrelevant startups are those that get to at least $100 million in revenue because those are the companies that can attract the most funding, they create the most jobs, they create the most wealth, and they have actually the lowest cost of capital going forward, and they can acquire other companies. And in the US, this is another amazing statistic, per year, dating back to 1980, between 100 and 250 companies reach this target. Now, these are not all high-tech companies. This includes, I don't know, The Gap or startup, uh, Starbucks or whatever it was. But it is amazing that every year there's 100 to 200 companies that reach $100 million for the first time. So that's impressive. Now, what's even more impressive is people that can go from 100 million to a billion. And this was studied in a book called Blueprint to a Billion. They looked at all the IPOs since 1980. This book was written in 2009. And what they found was, out of these, all these IPOs, only 70 were 
uh, IT or high tech companies, technology companies that had revenue of greater than a billion. But the amazing thing about the statistic is these 70 companies, which is just 1% of all public companies they've created, had more market value than all the other companies combined. Obviously, this list included Apple and Google and, and so on and so on. And the single most amazing thing about this is that these companies went from 100 million roughly to a billion in often as little as four to six years. So the ability to grow quickly into a large company is, is proven. I mean, this has been done many, many times before. I've been involved with two companies that actually have achieved this. One was Sun Microsystems and more recently Arista. You can go from 100 million to a billion in four or five years. Um, now, you do need large markets, needless to say. You need to have a sustainable, differentiable value proposition. You need to have big customers. You, you know, it helps to have a profitable business model and it's helped to have experience. But the bottom line is, you know, those are the companies, uh, those are the opportunities that are worth going after. Um, and let me now switch back to Germany. Uh, this is some dated numbers. Germany will probably have the most venture capital in the EU, especially after the UK leaves. Um, but uh, uh, Berlin, of course, is home to most of the startups. Over half the German startups are right here. Uh, worldwide, it's number nine. Now it moved up from number 15 a few years earlier. So that, that all of this is good. And there was a great report published by the Minister of Economic Affairs about the digital economy. And he concluded that Germany is the number five IT market after US, China, Japan, and UK, and the number six in the G20 for digital economy. This doesn't sound all that bad until you realize it's the wrong metrics. The reality is most IT and internet in Germany is done by US companies, quite frankly. So yeah, the, the consumers use the internet and yes, 5% of all transactions go on the internet, but the benefit of this really accrues to companies that are not German companies. And there are some successful German startups. Uh, most of them are focused on, on B2C, you know, selling shoes on the internet or whatever it is. And that's great, you know, I'm not saying that's not good. But there's, comparatively speaking, very little innovation in, in hard new technology in Germany, surprisingly, because there's a lot of smart people here. Um, and um, my key point to you is it's not too late, okay? Because the majority of all this innovation is still ahead of us. Now, obviously, you wouldn't start a new search engine today or a new social network. It's too late for that, or a new operating system, right? You would focus on new applications that don't exist yet. And these will be key to, in, to promote growth. Now, I picked one example um, that, you know, I, when I was a young student here, I looked at this plan to form Airbus. And I, I didn't think it's going to work. You know, five companies flying the wing from one place to the other one and all the politics on different countries. You know, I just thought this was crazy. Well, this was a startup. This was a startup company in 1970. In 2001, Airbus booked more planes than Boeing. So it can be done with focused attention. Um, but you now, why did Airbus succeed? Well, they built a better product. The Airbus plane was a better plane than the Boeing planes at the time. The competition was slow to respond. There's a huge barrier to entry to be in the plane business, needless to say. They had the funding and they had, the, uh, had a skilled labor pool, of all things, that was able to do this and committed leadership. So it can be done, and maybe one should look at this example as an example of what can be done in Europe. But what can we learn? All innovation, all successful IT companies lead with innovation. You have to have innovation to, to get ahead. Number two, the innovation has greatly, greatly increased in the last you know, 15 to 10, 15 years. And it is a global race, okay? Make no mistake about this. There's a lot of investment in China, in even in India these days, and certainly it continues in the US. But the most important thing here is that we are in a market-driven economy. And progress depends, this is a quote from The Economist, I believe, on the creation of new business models that rewards more effective outcomes and benefits to society. So the point I want to make here is that in the end, you have to keep the consumer in mind that benefits from this. And, you know, I know there's, in, in English, they have the saying, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> what this means is, you know, yes, there's all these rules, but basically their role is to protect the status quo, quite frankly, okay? And unfortunately, this hinders innovation. It drives innovation elsewhere, and it has a lot of un unintended consequences. For example, the open Wi-Fi spots in Germany. So I guess they finally the, the law is changing that the provider of the access point is not liable if somebody downloads a copyrighted movie, okay? 
But the net result of this was that compared to other countries, Germany has one open Wi-Fi spot for 10,000 people. In South Korea, it's 37. In the U.S. it's 28. It's really hard to get an open connection here. And, you, know, you always have to ask for a password or register. It's very complicated. Another example are these, what I would call, over-the-top telco services. So basically free calling and free messaging on top of the internet, which is what Apple FaceTime and WhatsApp and Google Hangouts do, is very, very popular with consumers because it's free. It costs nothing, right? But apparently, somebody um, in Brussels decided this needs to be regulated. I'm not the expert again why this has to be regulated, but it can't help the consumer you know, to make this more expensive or more complicated or whatever. And the last thing is, you know, the US has one big advantage. I, I picked these two maps because they have similar color coding, but I don't need to explain to you that the US is one country, one market. You start a company in California, you can sell to a market of 330 million users without any hesitation. In Europe, it's called a single EU economy, but it's far from that. It's not a single market. And anything that could be done to accelerate the transition to a single market would benefit startups, mid-sized companies, big companies alike, because the barriers are incredibly high. Let me just mention one topic, logistics. So apparently one big problem here is the cost of shipping something from Germany to Spain. And yeah, it's complicated, you know, you need to rent the truck and so on. But there is one company that is solving this problem, which is Amazon. They're building their own logistics. They're not hindered by the cost of the existing infrastructure. And unless you know, people react to that and get more competitive, Amazon will just take over in logistics. It's, it's a hard situation, but you know, that's sort of the competition here. So uh, I'm getting to my last slide here. It's my main recommendations is go faster. Don't slow down, because the future you know, is not waiting for slow decision making. And if I could appeal to you to make innovation a national priority or an EU priority, whatever is more politically correct, that would be a good thing. Now, you know, there's a lot of talk about how to change education to help with this. The one point I would like to make is Germany is the world leader in, in fundamental physics and chemistry and all kinds of fundamental uh, research, which is great. But unfortunately, that's not digital future, okay? It's, it's, you know, don't, don't invest less in physics, but we've got to invest more on the digital side. And I would pick artificial intelligence as the one example where Germany is truly now far behind. And that doesn't bode well because AI has more opportunity to change more things than any other thing ever invented. And make sure the digital market you know, gets there sooner. So the bottom line is in the future, the, the winners are those companies that embrace, not, not just companies, countries, you know, societies that embrace this digital change more rapidly and evolve with technology more quickly. Because if, you, if you're not ahead, by definition, you fall behind. It's a very you know, brutal economic kind of thing. And I don't need to tell you that in the end, economics usually win. So those are all the slides I had. Thank you for your attention. And um, I hope this was interesting. Thank you very much, Mr. von Bechertsheim. It's always good to have an outside view on Germany. I try to summarize, go faster, and it depends on solving the right issues, but also it's not too late. Along those lines, we want to continue with our conference. I would like to welcome you for the next few hours in which, in which we will be debating digitalization in large companies, but also medium-sized companies. My name is Anke Plettner. I'm a freelance journalist. You might know me from Phoenix or ID Morgan magazine, where we time and again discuss these issues. But as we already heard, digitalization is not a household term. It has reached all levels of society, but is still a difficult topic. And that's good to, uh, that we start to discuss this with industry. We will start with the large companies and see how much has changed for them and what politics can do to support them. I would like to welcome Mr. Hoss, Mr. Justus, and Mr. Fisman, as well as Mr. Jatzombeck. Mr. Jatzombeck 
over there, Mr. Fisman. Mr. Zombeck stepped in for Nadine Schön, who cannot be with us today, which does not mean that there are no women in digitalization, but when we look around here in the audience, there's still way for improvement. I would like to introduce my guest, Hans Josef Horst, is a member of uh, the area management uh, business materials services with ThyssenKrupp. He is responsible for the digital strategy, and since 1995, he has been working with ThyssenKrupp. He also worked in the United States, uh, was responsible for the digitalization of the US business, knows the outside view, therefore. ThyssenKrupp has 165,000 staff. It is a large company, therefore. I would like to introduce Philip Justus. He knows all companies we've addressed a moment ago in eBay, PayPal, Google, because he worked with all of them. Since 2013, he has been Vice President of Google Central Europe, also responsible for Germany. Maybe he had a, a difficult uh, night after the fines the EU Commission has imposed on Google, but we will be addressing that in a moment. We have Maximilian Fissmann. You know the Fissmann Group. They know the way with the temperature. It's hot or cold. They are responsible for heating and cooling systems. It's a traditional family-owned company that has celebrated its 100th anniversary. You are the fourth generation, and Maximilian Fissmann has been CEO of Fissmann Group since July since June, and he is responsible for the digitalization of this family-owned business. Thomas Jetzombeck is the chairperson of the Working Group for Digital Agenda in the CDO CSU Group. He worked with IT services after concluding his studies for a number of medium-sized companies in the Dusseldorf area, which is its, his constituency. Warm well, welcome to all of you. We agree that you briefly say something on new companies and that we then start the discussion and open up to the floor later on. Mr. Hors, maybe you can start. What does digitalization mean for ThyssenKrupp? First of all, Mr. von Bechertzheim, it was uh, an excellent presentation. Thank you very much for this inspiring talk. We are an industrial company of 215 years his history, and to debate digitalization is interesting. Why are we part of this? Let's start with Mr. Kauder's constituency. You may have heard that we've invested in the construction of a tower in Rottweil. Um, we have new lift systems or elevator systems uh, based on a, a magnetic system which can not only lift up and down but also sideways. These lifts are connected with the cloud. We have a so-called max box. We measure temperatures of machines, acoustic signals, for example, when opening and closing the doors. These signals and data is transferred to the cloud with self-learning self algorithms, and we are analyzing when uh, an engine is about to fail in order to reduce breakdown time. The aim is to reduce breakdown time by 50%, and if a service technician is needed, he can communicate with Microsoft Turbulence, a, a partner, use and uh, enter the elevator shift and can call in an external technician to tell them what to do in order to reduce breakdown times. I'm with materials services. We have 480 sites. We have 250,000 customers all in industry with uh, traditional materials trading system, stainless steel, aluminum, etc., and provide services to the, up to the full supply chain management. If you've flown from the United States to Germany, you've used Airbus or Boeing, we help to make the sheets for the outer skin of the plane um, to make them available to the 
aviation industry. What we do with digitization is five points. Our customers want more. They want better information, more information, and want to be able to access that easily, so easy access. Digitalization is not a matter um, in itself. It helps to support the overarching business objective. And that is why our vision is to maintain our status offline and online in B2C, in trading materials, supply chains. Uh, we want to expand our position. In addition, we need the entire digitization through the entire value-added chain in our company. We must start with our suppliers and end with our customers or turn around. We start with the customers and end with suppliers. There's not a single element we don't look at in order to improve digitalization, which means we need leeway or staff must be able to look at the element and to add in an innovative edge what we do with the TK Innovation Garage, which is one of the leading digital labs in Germany and was voted by Capital. There's also agility. We must provide our staff with leeway to test out new things. They must be able to fail. That's very important. And finally, the transformation process must be ensured we have a digital transformation office which tries to manage the change from the inside. However, we also need speed boards for 3D printing, for example, and provide impetus from the outside perspective. ThyssenKrupp is dealing intensively with the topic of digital change in all business areas. But we also have demands to politics where we need support. And that is, above all, and was a striking figure Mr. Fuchs gave us, when 98.7% do not have fiber optics, we are too slow. We need broadband, and in addition, we need 5G. More and more data is transferred from A to B, and we need the necessary infrastructure. Second, we need a strong harmonization of legislation in Europe because too many local interpretations means an added in complexity for companies. And we need training of staff and more investment in the training of staff, not only at our universities, but we have to start in kindergartens and uh, bring technology close to children. Thank you. Because we find and there's an interesting article in the Handelsblatt today, which I can recommend. Today, we have a, a massive so shortage of software engineers, people who help us to hel help us along on the digital journey. And we need a much stronger initiative along those lines. I would like to ask Beth on that, but we'll do that later. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'd like to. Continue with Mr. Fisman. Your company is not as big as ThyssenKrupp and slightly younger, but tell us about Fisman digital transformation. First of all, I'm delighted to be able to uh, represent uh, the smallest company today and to be able to tell you about uh, digital transformation with Fisman. If you try to stand back for a second, and Mr. von Bechertsheim, you talk what's going on around us, where we're still trying to grasp what's actually happening and try to implement that in Germany. We find that the degression of costs in the field of technology is unparalleled at the moment. And when we look at medium-sized companies in Germany and what makes them successful. It has always been technology-driven innovation, which certainly meant that we were the cost leader in this part of industry or with a specific technology. There are many companies, traditional companies, not necessarily 100 years old, but 30, 40 years old, 
and they try to understand why this is happening, why is it happening, and I don't have any interfaces with my core business. Companies addressing these issues try to understand what they can do. They are certainly on the right way, but what is difficult and only becomes obvious at the end of the journey, the challenge to traditional companies is the execution. That is one of the reasons why many companies fail because they don't are not able to execute. Traditional companies in the end at the end of the day often find that a mix of resources and how companies were developed over the rec over recent years incrementally is not the best precondition for developing a company in a digital world. Over the past two and a half years, we said we need a portfolio of activities and I have to see it realistically. What transformation can we achieve in our core business? What scalability, what improvements can be achieved in a realistic time? What topics can be upscaled with new competences we did not previously have in our company. And the third line is that you need courage. You have to see an entrepreneurial set an entrepreneurial view on new activities. Two years ago, we decided to launch a venture capital fund that only deals with detail companies in Europe and also to build up deep tech companies as a company builder. I, we are then most likely that new technologies develop in Europe. But if I'm convinced that Germany is my home country and I believe in Germany as a good side for business, it's the right step. Did you reduce jobs or create jobs in a digital context of we employed an additional 300 staff in, in our company. A younger company, Google, Mr. Justus, what does it mean to you? You are the traditional or the classical digital company, 17 years. We're almost 19 years. Thank you very much for inviting me. I didn't want to talk so much on Google, but more on our theories on digitization. The first three theorem I brought one of five is that digital generation in Germany is better than what is usually believed. And I'm more optimistic than Mr. van Bestia's time because I think with many more small and medium sized companies, we see that uh, German companies understand digitalization as an opportunity for their core business. The DAX 30 companies and the large family owned companies see a lot of transformation, a lot is going on in this field. I am more optimistic as regards the flagships of digitization, the purely digital companies. We tend to not think enough or to speak enough about this. these examples. We talk about uh, examples of good startups. I would like to mention United Internet, Zalando, Trivago, Delivery Hero, My Taxi, similar to what we heard about Uber, SoundCloud, Credit Tech. We don't hear half as much about these companies as about Dask companies. While they are very successful, and most of them have a market capitalization of more than 100,000, 100 million US dollars, I would hope for more successful st or success stories in Germany. The second theorem is digitization is not a zero sum game. In the public debate, we often hear Silicon Valley against German companies, state ups, startups fighting established companies, and I don't think that's helpful because we usually assume that there is a cake that's being distributed, but in truth, it's different. A lot is linked to innovation. We heard about that. New things are developed, new applications, new products are being created, and new partnerships. And if we need the right mindset, we have to look for the win-win situation between companies, look at whom we can cooperate with to be successful in the field of digitalization. The third theorem is that 
speed is far more relevant than size um, when it comes to digitalization. Over the past five, six, seven years, industries have completely changed in the digital world. Those who are no longer innovative today will be overtaken tomorrow by a competitor probably that did not exist 12 months ago. It is always helpful to look at the type of digital technologies I can employ. And I don't have to uh, develop everything myself. I have to see who can provide the technology. It's one of the experiences we've made. Um, all medium-sized companies and crafts uh, companies are able to do that through the cloud. Uh, storage capacities, interfaces, machine learning, etc., can be um, brought in from the internet. I don't have to be an expert in all these fields myself. The fourth theorem is linked to uh, hate talk. Hate talk on the internet must be fought, uh, um, fought with, with the right means. Uh, the democratization of communication is one of the main feeds of the internet, but it reaches its limits when it comes to hate talk. As a provider um, f like YouTube, we make major efforts to effectively counter hate talk. We very much welcome the debate on um, on these issues. It is uh, limiting hatred and violence, but we are warning, warning um, you of the instruments provided. The draft act of the Ministry of uh, Justice is going in the wrong direction, and almost all experts say so. Systems to eliminate uh, content must not uh, limit free speech. And the decision on what content can be provided should not be in the hands of private companies. We need state institutions. High fines when content is not removed will unavoidably lead to a situation that companies are over, overly cautious when removing content. Even with the amendments uh, um, suggested by the CDU CSU, will ha mean that this act will ha massively impact uh, the the freedom of speech on the internet. The UN Commissioner for Freedom of Speech is concerned about this act, and that would be a unique situation worldwide. I therefore appeal to the members of the Bundestag who are here today but uh, we believe that there are significant problems with the act on the table at the moment. You should really look at that once again, because it's very important that you do this thoroughly and not quickly. My fifth theorem is that we need a broad-based digital education offensive in Germany. The EU Commission believes that 900,000 jobs will not be filled in Europe because uh, we don't have the skilled workers. We have jobs, but we don't have skilled labor. And that's a huge opportunity for us in Germany. The federal government has launched a, a education initiative for the digital society. For us at Google, it's one of the top topics. For us as company, but as an industry, we become involved in projects like Calliopia, microcontrollers, small computers brought to the, um, primary school grades. We support uh, training of developers. We provide training programs for students and employees. But we are still at the very beginnings. Even as a large company, we can just make a single contribution. And I would like to appeal to politics, education providers, and companies. We have to make great progress over the next four years. And you can rely on us as a partner. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Mr. Jatzombek, the companies have given you a lot of homework. We are too slow. The, we have not understood the culture of failure. Mr. Fisman said you must give uh, a lot of leeway to your staff. We heard that we need investments in education, but we had a direct appeal to not 
uh, concerned with the draft act, maybe you want to react to that where you see your main task. Well, this was not meant to be the priority today. A brief answer will be enough then. I didn't hear about self-control with uh, Mr. Justus. I uh, fully agree with your criticism of the draft act. We um, have t um, tabled 25 amendments to this very short act for almost the first time ever at the Bundestag. And we ch changed the engine of the act and, act and you can organize yourself in a self-control unit, which you organize. And I think this will do away with the fear of overblocking. You have to organize it yourself, however. It is important that this is uh, brought to the light, as done with Facebook, that uh, the procedure is understandable and transparent. In the surrounding hearings, we heard similar to cartel law. With companies who have a monopoly for opinion, we need um, an obligation to mirror certain things that you cannot rule out the participation of specific news in your statutes. A second point which I see as very positive, four years ago, we've flew over to Silicon Valley under leadership of Philipp Rösler, and I met Mr. von Bechertelm, and I asked him what we have to do in Germany. And uh, you said, well, Germany, but uh, you've come here today to give a presentation, I think is a good signal to all of us, Choose that we have achieved quite a bit over the past four years. We did a lot with our digital agenda on the broadband internet. It is not, the infrastructure is not there, but the money has been earmarked. We want to have 5G by 2025. We have fiber optics first as our strategy. We uh, looked at IT security, and as we also launched a billion euro programs to have startups with funding. Mr. Justus mentioned some of them, Trivago and Deliver Hero and Zalando. I think the biggest bottleneck is actually staff. And Andreas von Bechertsheim is one example. He, he went to the United States, and we can no longer accept that in future. We need good information technology, the coalition agreement in North Australia uh, says that 10 years ago we had a good project which uh, wanted to bring musical instruments close to children to provide every child with one musical instrument because we said those who don't have access to musical instruments sh can never find out whether they have a musical talent. Now part of the coalition treatment is one line of code to every child because children who never learn how to program a computer never can decide whether their talents are more in this field or others. And the war of talent is still one of the main factors. Uh, the Frankfurter Allgemeine, for example, said that uh, programming computer is for specialists only, and I think this is the faulty approach. I learned a lot during school when I never needed afterwards, but they were important to understand things. Artificial intelligence was also one of the buzzwords. I heard about Moonshot with Google. Many used that later on. The blockchain and artificial intelligence are the main challenges. We don't have to occupy the fields where we have many competitors already, but we have to find new fields. And challenges are tremendous for humanity, and Germany has to stick to that. However, what works well in Germany, machine engineering, engineering, we have good products, traditional companies who have been on the market for a long time. How? Are they successful in opening up? How can they combine that? Mr. Fisman, how do you find your employees? What do you need and where could politics actually help? I think it's a broad field. The first statement is that we are in a war of talents. 
and it is a global war. It is. It has shifted towards Asia and the west of the United States. It's something we have to accept. We now have to think about what preconditions are possible in a country where uh, the presence of uh, the members of parliament is documented in lists on paper. Administrative structures are one of the conditions for making Germany an attractive country also for international founders. So we shouldn't be at the end of the line of e-government. Quite often, it's the fundamentals, the, the basics, being able to facilitate the startup of companies, facilitating administrative processes, no longer in a physical way, but enabling them in a digital way so that they live up to the 21st century. That would contribute to increasing the attractiveness of Germany as a site for business. A company like yours. How do you make it attractive so that people go to Fisman, not to Google? At the end of the day, I believe, we will have to see how it varies between established companies, but to have an, a working ecosystem in Germany, we need early stage ventures, we need young companies, we need a breeding ground for being able to implement a topic which I would like to take up currently. A founder, as Mr. Bechertzheim said, you're amongst the top 10 today, which which is great. But it's not something where we can rest on our laurels. We need talents as a magnet to make this an attractive ecosystem. In a second step, established companies like Fisman, but also like Google, should become anchor points to work with companies or to later on uh, provide a safe harbor to these companies, but to be able to do so, I need a liquid, a functioning ecosystem where there are basic factors we don't have today. But why can't you provide them as a company? Well, we can provide a lot, but I don't think we can provide the critical kicker. What we can do is invest in early stage through venture capital to provide the necessary funds in the high-risk area. But at the end of the day, what we do in company setting and building a FISMAN group in a digital context, in particular with AOT and artificial intelligence, these are exciting tasks which make it attractive for talents to work with us. What about you? Um, where do you get your staff? Where do you find your employees that should work with ThyssenKrupp? We sit in Essen. Essen is... Now we are located in Essen. Essen is a well-known city in Germany, but it is not necessarily associated with change, modernity, and software and the like. But I can tell you, we are very much we're very much better than our reputation. That's true. Nonetheless, it's a challenge for us, and I'd like to. You know, add a little bit of spice to this discussion and, and, and polarize a bit. As a company that wants to change, that wants to transform, we need other nerds. We need other nerds than somebody who is setting up a, a virtual product. We have haptic and physical experiences, and the people who work with us have to have the fun of ensuring that they manufacture a product that will exist 20 years into the future. Those are people that are wired a little bit differently than those who work in a virtual environment and build marketplaces there. But we need them, and we need them urgently. We deliberately go public with these messages, and that's why I mentioned our um, magnetic uh, elevator, because this is an attractive product for our company. We become visible for IT people as well by highlighting on these products. We're luckily enough located on the campus in Essen, so there's an attractive working environment, but nonetheless, it's not easy. And we're competing with many others in 
Düsseldorf Media Hafen and other locations, they also recruit all over Germany. Germany as a whole is vamping up its um, IT and digital environment, and we're competing with them, and it's not easy. We see a different wage development in these specific jobs. The wages? Yes. I mean, that doesn't have anything to do with um, collective bargaining. It's just different. We're noticing that it is more difficult to find people in this field. And that's why I made the appeal for training of specialized um, workers in that field. And that begins as early as kindergarten, but it doesn't end there. If we want to become faster in Germany, we also have to focus on enablement. So policymakers needs to need to help us to set the right conditions for companies that they find um, the right people. We need new employment legislation for working times. We need to have the leeway to work differently from the ways we used to work in the past. And then um, leasing workers or um, temporary workers, that legislation also isn't easy. So we need to s find support from policymakers that these general conditions change so that we become attractive for young people so that they can join us and join in the new possibilities that exist. Now, I don't want to make value statements on the um, quality of the current ThyssenKrupp um, staff, but those who are fascinated by haptic products already exist in our company, but what's missing is people who can actually implement um, innovation. What I'm seeing in the IT context is very, very well um, products that um, were developed on a proprietary basis, but are very far removed from setting up a scale, um, scalable um, infrastructure. And the skills that are necessary to achieve that within the tech context are not linked to the embedded software know-how that you need to have in place to establish the hardware. And that's why we have so many difficulties. We have great engineers, mechanical engineers, electric tech, um, engineers, etc., and they all have great skills. But in the virtual realms of the Internet of Things, these people don't have neither the experience nor the skills, which is okay. And you mentioned enablement. I can only highlight that. It's strange that um, you use so many German, uh, so many English words here. Okay, enablement um, is a German word now. So we've invested quite a lot in the past two years to enable the existing team that is very passionate about what we're doing and we want to give them the possibilities and the skills to develop further and to recognize where, in addition to what they've done in the past, they can create an added value. So I think it's very interesting to put this on an abstract level and differentiate between the existing core competences and the things that need to be added either through enablement or through the acquisition of entirely new competences and skills. But that takes quite some time. If we start in the kindergarten, it takes quite some time until we have um, skilled staff there. So, Mr. Yusuf, what could we do in concrete terms to really prepare society in a better way? Now, if I can just come back very quickly um, to this question of how to find the right um, employees for digital um, tasks and projects. We're also facing the mm, competition to find the right talents. And we see that talents go to the place where big, important challenges can be solved and where they can do it with a certain level of freedom and where they're equipped in the right way, i.e. our software developers want to work on difficult problems. They look for companies that say, not only do we have a difficult problem, but we're doing it with a um, great um, economy of scale, we're doing it with a lot of um, computing power and a lot of data, and we make all of that available to you. That's what software developers um, really end up being enthusiastic about. It's not so much a question of how much you pay them, it's um, the size of the problems and their 
um, ability of making a difference. And I think that's the mindset you need to have when you ask yourself the question how you find the right um, people, whether it's um, the mindset of learning, software developers, whatever. Um, it's very much linked to the culture of the company where there's a process of either the executive level telling you um, what the problem is and what you need to work on for the next three years. That's not a good um, idea for software developers or whether you have a situation where they can introduce their own ideas, where they have a certain time of their working time that they can spend on developing their own projects. That's always a good idea and that keeps them passionate and um, loyal. Google has the 20% time where we um, give 20% of the time to our software developers to work on their own projects, something that's not even listed on a project plan list, something that is not superimposed on them from executives. They can use 20% um, to work on a topic that's not predefined. And um, it's easy to implement that. It just requires a little bit of rethinking. It's not this typical way of doing business in a classic um, enterprise to let people work on whatever they want to work on. And you have to make that visible. You have to um, show whether the ideas are good or not so good. It's not entirely void of control, but it's this freedom and the enthusiasm of um, doing that. Um, you know, if you have a really crazy topic that your people can work on, they might also come up with great new um, answers. Mr. Hotz, what's your experience? You notice that your company is changing. Um, do the employees follow suit, or are there many who say it used to be good the way it was, and they have a certain level of concerns that digitization might lead to the destruction of jobs? What's your experience? We have a very intense change management process, meaning we have an interdisciplinary team with um, external experts that we brought on board, and we gave them the task to um, find out how our 20,000 um, business area employees can be involved in these new digital um, ways. We develop a um, toolkit that we always use when we roll out digital tools. And why am I mentioning this? Because one of the topics that we always do in the beginning when we um, introduce a new digital tool is we ask the employees regarding their expectations um, with a view to this tool. And we ask them what their fears or potential fears are, and then we look at what we can do to counter them. Do you know what the number one topic was that was fed back to us? It wasn't, will I lose my job? The number one concern of our employees in these workshops was, how can I enable myself to be part of this development process and not be marginalized. For us, it was a very positive surprise to see that the people want to be involved. So thanks for your opinion. Mine is slightly different, but that's OK, because I think we have to give our employees an opportunity to come on board. But what we also need is this polarity. We need internal changes internal drivers to keep the employees on board, but we also need simultaneously to this feedback and um, ideas from the outside to see whether this change process is the right one. What is your yardstick when you say it's the right thing? Do you look at the United States or, or what do you measure yourself against to um, establish whether it's the right way or the wrong way? Well, we um, also organized a learning um, expedition to the United States with our executives. We went to um, Silicon Valley and to other hubs in the United States and Germany. We also have an ecosystem of companies that we always exchange information with on a continuous basis because they um, are slightly ahead of us on this digital journey and we are networking with them. And I'm on your page when it comes to us not setting up um, problem-solving solutions for every um, field. So we need to have an ecosystem of partner companies that we cooperate with. Um, one example, um, we work with um, you, for example. We set up a couple of um, shops, workshops for our customers from online self-service to um, e-commerce. And we did that together with Google because we know that they're in a better position with in that field than we are. And we learned mutual learning um, process and we develop in that direction. OK, you said we need um, external um, competences and you need to look at the um, founding scene um, with a close detail. But 
in 10 years, let's use this, this iPhone phase of 10 years. Now, um, Mr. Fisman, would you say the time of the classic big companies is over? Now, in the beginning, I said we're not a big company, so, hmm. I think there's there's one central answer to this. There's no organization, not even a political um, organization, that is an end in itself. Mostly, you solve a problem for a customer or a user that retroactively justifies that you continue to solve this problem in the future. And we very simply use different methods to look at what our customers or our future customers want also when it comes to um, the world of digitization and what are the problems that we can solve by um, scaling up solutions also within the framework of digital um, technologies and there's no reason why a company should no longer exist in the future if it um, does all of these things and we are sitting here together because we are very well aware of this responsibility. It is um, not enough to just understand what is going on. We should already be in the implementation phase, and implementation requires other cultural requirements than those that have been in place in the um, past couple of years. And um, it is a problem of established and tried and tested um, economies. Mr. Justus, what do you think? Do big opportunity uh, do big companies still have an opportunity, or would it make more sense for them to split up into smaller companies? Would that be more um, reasonable and viable for the future of digitization? Well, I hope that bigger companies still have an opportunity in the future because we are among the bigger companies. So I hope so. What we try to do at Google and um, with our parent company Alphabet is to break down into smaller units within the company and give them individual responsibility, for example, for the browser Chrome or for the operating system Android or for a project like um, self-driving cars. You know that we're working on that. So these are individual units. So we do something that German companies have probably been doing for decades or centuries now, namely to set up business units that are organized in a high um, degree of autonomy. Um, what doesn't work is to have one big hierarchy within a company and always have an upward movement. That doesn't work as uh, very well. But this fragmentation um, needs to prove itself. Um, it needs to be proven that you can act as quickly as the small companies that exist. But we always look at the next startup in the next garage and um, what they are doing. In the past three, four, five years, we've seen many examples where um, a handful of people 20 to 30 people developed great things with um, a lot less resources and a lot less people than we did as a big company. So for us, this is always the um, driver to um, advance with this you know, division of cells. And how can support from the side of politics um, be organized? Now, that's the first question we have to ask ourselves. What's the task of policymakers and what's the task of um, companies? It's not up to us to um, tell companies how to organize their processes and how to um, set themselves up. I can only say for me that I'm um, doing politics for this and that reason. Um, as Mr. Eustace said, um, there are certain tasks that need to be fulfilled, and one of mine is to be here today. But on the other hand, I can also develop a lot of projects individually. So I asked myself, um, would I want to join a company where this is not possible? Very clear answer is no. Entrepreneurship is an important thing. I um, have a found um, a startup, M M Mapudo, in, 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 in Düsseldorf. And there was an employee who um, wanted to, um, you know, launch his own company and start something up and sell a product to Tusen. Um, it didn't work that well. But maybe it's very clear. Our task is that we have to help wherever the market um, cannot do it all by itself. And we did it um, with venture um, capital. Um, KFW 
has um, an all um, venture um, capital um, range. Um, we have the um, Tech Roll Fund with 10 billion as a um, lighthouse project to also show that Germany is a country where venture capital um, exists and where um, from the side of politics there is a tension with regard to that um, issue. And secondly, we need software developers in North Rhine-Westphalia. We um, didn't only say um, one line of code for every kid. Our um, startup um, idea is we want to be the region with the um, highest number of software developers per capita. And we need to, you know, um, put on other hats. We need to um, think outside the closet. We need we have Tom Bachmann, who um, started a coding school, which is going to Berlin now and not to um, North Rhine-Westphalia, although he would have rather liked to do it in um, Cologne. But that wasn't good for Cologne. So we have to think about how that can be done, um, particularly also for um, people who um, have more unconventional um, biographies, and a lot of the people in IT do have that. And we need to set the right um, framework conditions for that. And the best startups will develop where the best um, software developers are, or that's also where the classic companies will be transformed. Essen, even though um, Düsseldorf is a better place for um, Thyssen, I have to say that because it's my constituency, but when you when you look at where our hidden champions are, Münsterland, Sauerland, there are a lot of really excellent companies that have uh, difficulties attracting young people who studied in Düsseldorf, Berlin, or um, Cologne, and it's, it's hard to you know, convince them to go to the rural areas because there's a cool company there. Well, but how can companies do that? Well, if you only have a handful of um, graduates and they're all begging, they will focus on the companies that exist. So we have to you know, have a higher number of companies and a higher number of graduates. We just saw 50% of the startups are located in Berlin. That's OK. But the more people you train, the more uh, you, will, you will have who will stay in their home region and do whatever they do there. Now, if you're company that's active in Germany and the classic companies that we presented um, are active in Germany. So are there things where Google can, for example, learn from Germany or the way um, companies are managed in Germany? Sure, about 50% of our employees in Germany work very closely with companies in Germany. The other 50% um, develop software. And the cooperation that we have with small, medium-sized companies shows that um, there are a lot of things that we believe to be interesting and new. And that is l um, surely based on the ability to present high quality products and manufacture high quality products, whether they're physical or not. And in Germany, we are very um, apt at doing this. We come from a software world where it's frequently said that we market products and then improve them. So it's a process that is based on many iterations. You don't have the perfect solution um, the first time around. And we are thrilled by the virtues of Germany's um, product quality to do something the perfect way the first way around. But doesn't that slow down the pace? Well, yes, but sometimes you end up with a better result. I'm not saying that everything is being internalized immediately, but it's something that we see and that we appreciate when cooperating with German companies. What I also find, and that's important, is that German companies think longer about how to approach digitization. And when they do it, they do it more consistently than um, companies in the neighboring uh, countries do. So. In Germany, the threshold is always higher when it comes to convincing companies. But as soon as they um, get going, they get going. And then they don't stop. They try until it works. And that's something we like. Did you do it the same way? Was it a longer process? How, how did it start? When did you notice in your company that you really have to change now? And, and what can you, you know, pass on to other companies? The best trigger in our case the best thing that really made us become active was the learning expedition to the United States. One thing that needs to be stressed is that we do we, we cannot do without developing in this direction. We have to understand digitization and embrace it. And I'm deeply convinced of this. For us, it was important to not only understand this in the highest board level, and establish it there, but we also needed to reach out to 
the mid levels um, because those are people who are responsible for a couple of thousand of employees and generate um, a lot of revenue and we took all of them on board and we created a mindset where the urgency was understood and in addition to urgency the willingness to um, set out um, and you know embark on this journey and the willingness to be innovative is very important I can only highlight that um, if you continue with if you continue doing business with the um, same status quo way that you have, you will not get to where you want to get. You have to be faster. You have to be willing to also lose some investments. But you invested because you were quick. You wanted to try something. And while trying, you achieved um, a learning. And then you, you know, just move on to the next solution. So it wasn't or it isn't in vain to, to pursue that um, path. Mr. Fisman, was there a trigger, something that made you say, this is what we need to change now? And what would you tell other companies based on the experience that you've made? I think, and that's more a general task of management, the most important thing is to do whatever you're doing in an authentic way. It's not helpful for none of us to, for example, copy the ecosystem of Tel Aviv because it looks so great from the outside and now we need to internalize it in our company. No, you have to ask yourselves, what is the unfair um, advantage that I have in my current business and what can I develop on the basis of this? And then I do it in a passionate way. Three years ago, my father and I talked about um, this and he told me, I know what it means for our company. I can fully understand that this development will have a massive impact on the next five years of our business. But for the first time in my management career, I can not fully predict how to react to it. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs experience this as well. The topics that now have an impact on the existing business have entirely follow entirely different logics and require a new way of looking at things with regard to implementation. And back then we said, let's do it together and um, you know put both feet onto the gas pedal to implement this as quickly as possible. And what you said, Philip, um, is absolutely right. The will to work in iterations is not necessarily part of the German culture. And it's right for hardware products to not um, roll something else uh, out and then have an iterative process. But there are um, business models that can be designed in an iterative way. And you need to set the right um, conditions that the employees and yourself run that risk. Now, changing the culture, is that something that has already um, permeated into politics? Or um, what do you think about that, Mr. Yersombek? I believe that the culture is changing massively. And we're in a phase of very strong um, changes in society. Um, yesterday, in this very room, we um, discussed um, marriage for everybody, which, by the way, is um, a very difficult um, terminology now that we just prohibited um, um, child marriages. But maybe it's just the terminology. Um, marriage for same-sex couples might be a different term. Uh, but it shows that we're um, in the middle of change processes where many people say this is going too quickly for me, um, I'm not following suit anymore, do we really need all of this without me wanting to make a statement on this? But otherwise, we're moving away from the actual topic. But um, I want to say change needs to happen. And the question is, how quickly can this change be and whether you can really um, get everybody on board? Well, the issue is change on the one hand, but on the other hand, um, there shouldn't be a feeling that everything that has been achieved so far, everything that um, provides a little bit of um, security and structure is thrown overboard. And maybe um, that also applies here. And the employees said they want to be part of it, but they um, want to participate, but they don't want to lose their job. And well, that's a contradiction, yes. I mean, it's a topic that we're very much discussing. And I said for the training, particularly in the field of digitization, is something that should become more of a priority. I think it would make sense to say we introduce the right to digital further training, because further training also needs to be organized. If I take every employee in Germany and um, 
let them participate in um, academies run by foundations or trade unions, etc. That's not going to work because it's going to cost a lot of money and they um, will also have um, a lot of missed working days. No, we need an individual based um, further training plan. Everybody needs to decide for themselves where they want to be five or ten years from today and what they need to do in order to prepare for that. But this needs to be based on a lot of individual responsibility. In this old Germany, which um, focused very much on everything being um, negotiated by the trade unions and um, employees didn't have to look about uh, anything. Th the digital world doesn't work like that. Some say fortunately, some say unfortunately, and it also creates a certain level of uncertainties because nobody knows what their jobs will be 10 to 15 years from today, what their qualifications will be. And in companies, you also have two types of people. Those who um, don't like the situation that they're in, they um, want to continue the way they've worked throughout their entire life until they retire, and um, they are very much um, affected by this um, change. And then there are the ones who have a disruptive gene and want to change things in the company already and sometimes run against walls because um, they're um, pace is too um, fast and they you know, learn and develop in their um, leisure time and think about new things and learn about new things. And I think for management, it's important to identify these people, keep them in the company and give them the freedom to no longer run against walls, but maybe um, enable them to carry out even more radical measures within the company. Thank you. We've learned quite a lot. It's about culture. And that's why I said in the beginning when you said we need people and particularly children with um, technical skills saw the image before my inner eye that they're already holding um, a cell phone or um, an, uh, an, an iPhone. But creativity um, is something that we need. And it shouldn't be forgotten in schools either. Now, thank you very much for um, giving us an insight into your companies. Thank you also, Mr. Yad Zombek. You will be back. And um, this is your round of applause now, gentlemen. Now, we've heard a lot about what um, politics can change and should change. Um, it's linked to culture and the possibility of creating um, framework conditions, um, fiber optic um, networks, etc., grids. We talked about that. And it's um, unfortunate that the federal minister hasn't heard too much about it, but um, I think he um, has a lot to say about this. Since the last term in office, we've had a minister for digital infrastructure, which didn't exist in the past. But this shows that the topic has become a priority and that things need to change digital infrastructure as one ministry um, together with the um, issue of transport. So um, Minister Dobrindt, cordial welcome to you. We're looking forward to your presentations, and I want to say the floor is yours. Welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this conference when we uh, debate this very important topic amongst the, the broad, broader group of the CDU-CSU political group. You're right, I would have liked to hear more, to be present more, but uh, this is the last uh, meeting week, the, the last week that the Bundestag sits, and uh, I, uh, the Committee on Digital Infrastructure wanted to see me today in order to debate some of the current issues that have to be solved. And the committee, I said, and it was especially about the committee and about the, the German Bundestag during this legislative period was the new combination of traditional infrastructure and the digital topics, not because we didn't have the digital topics in the past, but because they are now so high on the agenda that the general public focuses much more on them, that politics focuses much more on them, which was very successful. I always call this committee a committee for mobility and 
modernity because it closely combines these two aspects over the past two hours you have discussed how modernization through digitalization changes our country our society and our economy i am happy that we have so much time for such a debate what we see is that we have a new global competition not only between companies which takes a new form but also a competition between regions and states even who know in the field of digitalization that they are in a change in the world that we are living in a changing world that com Petition is changing, and that those who are successful today will not necessarily be successful in 10 years' time. <clears throat> we already heard about changing companies and regions. We are confident as an industrial nation, despite of all the difficulties we are discussing, but we are the leading edge in, in the automotive industry. No one doubts that in view of our vehicles today. But whether these companies will still be the leading edge of the automotive movement in 10 years' time, something no one can guarantee because the car will look entirely different in 10 years' time. So we must face up to the competition, which is not entirely new. We've known that in the past, in the 19th century, nation states had colonies and they competed in the 20th century. The industrialized nations competed for raw materials and resources. Today, the industrialized societies compete for digital aspects and data. What is clear to me is those who do not fully digitize will lose out quickly and easily. And it's not always possible to catch up on everything where you're lagging behind. The question whether we continue to be an innovative country region or whether we become a stagnating country is taken now in the area of digitalization. And it depends on the networking of all things. It is an exciting topic, I believe, because I have the feeling that when it comes to networking everything, an internet of everything, digitalization has reached a stage where we are actually strong. Germany's strength are now in the focus of the digital movement. We are the country of everything. We provide machines that to communicate. Communication between machines is what this is all about. So. The technology is ours, and the question is, who's is the data, the networking, who can actually add value from all these value elements? I think we should do our utmost to make it possible in Germany, but we need a new data culture. Data culture in this context means how to deal with large amounts of data. We have the premise in our legislation, which is scarcity of data. Scarcity of data is the basic principle to all legislative initiatives. But the question is whether scarcity of data actually helps us at a time where data is added value, or is data scarcity as a header, not rather now an obstacle to a movement which brings us into an age rich in data. I therefore believe we should readdress the topic of data scarcity. And what we need is creativeness and wealth of data instead of scarcity of data. Politics will has to once again address the issue of data scarcity uh, update it and think about how to enable uh, creativeness and richness in data. If you formulate that, you will see many critical views, not in this context, but in many others. 
And why is that? Because something is quite natural, more natural than determination to innovate. And that is a latent fear of innovation. A certain pessimism regarding new technologies, which is part and parcel of every debate. I think we cannot afford to have much of that over the next few months and years. During my first debates in my ministry on whether we need a digital testing field for automated vehicles in a real life situation on a real autobahn, can we have automated vehicles on the motorway, on a real life motorway? I firmly believe that we have that we need that in order to strengthen our automotive industry. But when we addressed, um, when I talked to uh, at my ministry, everyone was aghast, thinking about how a minister can think about these, this even. My colleagues who deal with all the topics said, Minister, you cannot do that. Who will be responsible if it turns out wrong, if something happens, if there's an accident? We discussed it and said, well, it's my profession to be responsible for progress in Germany. And everyone agreed once uh, it was uh, clear who w would be responsible in the end. But I had other discussions with other ministries, a ministry dealing with the law in particular, uh, that let me know when we had the first act on automated driving or when we tabled that. And we are, by the way, the only country in the world who has an act on automated driving. When we presented that, I was told that they could assume that automated driving went against our constitution. I briefly thought about that and thought, well, the founding fathers of the constitution will certainly not have thought about uh, automated driving. So sometimes the arguments don't hold because they are based on the permanent fear of innovation. We have to make progress in this field. I believe automated driving is one of the more um, topical aspects of how our entire society becomes more digital. And that is a real contribution to a link up to progress in the world, to keep abreast with developments in other countries. A digital testing fields on the A9 motorway. It's the only intelligent road because it has sensoric, sensoric data, 5G between the car and infrastructure, which enables communication. Only here, communication between the car and the, the um, infrastructure is possible without any speed limits, which is unique in the world. And no one said this is a clever decision by a minister of innovation in Germany to promote innovation in Germany. But you can look at the comments by people who launch comments in large newspapers. They claimed that what Mr. Durbrandt is is um, an attack on tra road traffic. It's a dangerous product, and technology is not marketable and should not be introduced into society at this stage. Ladies and gentlemen, if this is the benchmark for the introduction of new technologies into society over the coming few years, we shouldn't think about the distribution of future wealth because there will no longer be any wealth to distribute. We can only look at what other regions in the world, the United States or the Asian countries leave for us in Germany. I once said we must make sure that we are not a digital colony where we only provide data which in other regions of the world is turned into products that are sold back to Germany. That's not what I expect of Germany and of Europe. It's not what I expect of engineering in Germany. We can do much more 
and that's what we want to do. We I don't bow my head when I'm here and talk about what we did not achieve because I think we can be confident and say we can do a lot. In many debates, I hear that we are lagging behind when it comes to topic A and even further lagging behind when it comes to topic B. Well, I know the United States quite a bit, as many of you, and there are very strong regions like Silicon Valley, but I also know the other regions. And I don't think that uh, an American president, no matter who he is, when it comes to Europe, talks about that he talks the poor roads in New York and whether the Europe heard about that. No, he will talk about the strength of infrastructure, for example, in important regions and not about the greatest weaknesses. And I think we must eventually reach a, a, a mindset we, we talk about where we are first, not about where we are last. When it comes to broadband extension, it was one of the main topics in my ministry. I can talk about why we were so slow in the past. What I want to talk about is how to create a dynamism and catch up in this field. I have taken over this topic with a budget of zero euros. There was one night briefly before the coalition treaty was agreed, I was asked whether I would take over the digital field. And I agreed and said, well, that's a great idea. Excellent to have the digital field in addition to the transport sector, because the federal chancellor asked me. However, she neglected to say that there wouldn't be any funding for this field. But I hope she for simply forgot to tell me. During this legislative term, we had to provide funds, and we provided 4 billion euros, which are used for broadband expansion. And I don't want to complain about the amount of 4 billion, but it was a major initiative in combined with the Network Alliance for Digital Germany, where many companies are partners that agree to provide 8 billion every year into the expansion of the broadband together with our four billion funding program that closes the, the gap for the regions that cannot uh, receive any funding by companies because they're not attractive to companies. That's quite a number. Two point three billion euros have been pledged. We have enabled uh, fiber optics expansion by more than 200,000 kilometers, which is quite a bit. And we want to improve on further during the next legislative term. Four years ago, we set the objective. We are no longer as ambition. 50 Mbit was the target four years ago. No one would say that four years ago. You said, well, my God, you will never achieve that. And who? actually needs that today. We talk about a gigabit society as a matter of course, about the most recent technologies, fiber optics as a matter of course. And that is what we for our need gigabit networks for our gigabit society. Together with the Network Alliance, I formulated what gigabit networks means. It is much more than just bandwidth in the end. Some believe that it is sufficient if there's enough speed. But no, gigabit networks need intelligence, processors, must process data. A gigabit network will not be sufficient for real time if data in the United States go to a computer and have to be transferred and come back. I need data processing at shorter intervals, speeding speed of light more than 50 kilometers to and fro within milliseconds, not possible. And then you also need the processors, so that's the distance, and that's what it, the network of the future has to look like. And we want to build that. I think I said already that we want to provide 20 million euros in the future to set up such an intelligent network to make it possible by the year 2025, that's our target, 
and we need 5G. We are the first to say that we need 5G as a new mobile phone standard. It will enable real-time internet within one millisecond, real-time communication, so it's much more than just the mobile internet. And we need that for our automated driving. And I think we have to debate about automated driving. I talk to someone every day, but always about automated driving. And I find that many people think about whether we actually need that, whether driving a car is not a nice thing, whether we really need automated vehicles. And I tell people that it will save so much time. It will provide so much more safety and more mobility, for example, in, in old age. Of course, driving a car is fun, but I know roads in Germany. And being in the traffic jam in the morning to get to work and driving home from work when you're tired and driving to your relatives on the weekend, everything you don't like will be done autonomously in future as a matter of course. It provides a higher quality of life. And this is a technology that will prevail in the long term. I have recently tried that, which I tend to do when I try to monitor technological developments. A journalist was with me, it was exciting on the digital test field on A9 motorway. If you press the buttons and the car runs at 130 kilometers per hour autonomously, it overtakes, it changes the lanes. We were overtaken by two police cars, and I was talking intensively with the person in the back seat. But I think they recognized me, and we, we waved, and well, everything was fine then. They thought it was at least halfway OK. That is truly impressive also for those who see that these vehicles actually operate in a, in a test operation. Of course, I do not want to neglect the concerns of the people. Their worries have to be taken serious, and we have to answer their questions. We're the first country in the world for automated driving. To, uh, we've launched an, an ethics commission chaired by Uto Di Fabio, former judge on the uh, Constitutional Court. It was constituted last year. Two or three weeks ago, he presented their first report. They involved technologists, lawyers, etc. And the first report was presented on automated driving. I presented it at the um, G7 ministers meeting last week. My colleagues closely monitor what we do when it comes to automated driving regarding the legal framework conditions, the ethics commission, etc. It was really exciting because I always expect an ethics committee to say something extremely critical, to voice the concerns. But as the very first point, they said that automated driving is an ethical must, and that politics is responsible for promoting that simply because it increases the safety of people. And that is a viewpoint which I believe is very exciting, not only say what the computer can and may and must, and of course you have to address what happens if you cannot avoid an accident, you know all the debates. But in spite of all the topics which were also addressed by the Ethics Committee, to say at the end it is a must, we must implement that because it helps society. A technology of which ethics believes it's necessary for our society. It's an excellent outcome, I believe, and I'm very glad that we are able to once again 
take a leading role in the world. And I know that colleagues from all over the world are closely monitoring what Germany is doing because they believe we can learn from deficits in the past and to trigger positive developments for the future. Recently, I met the startup community in Berlin. It's great to see the type of ecosystem we see in Berlin now. We are amongst uh, the most dynamic startup regions in the world. We're amongst like, the top 10. Of course, venture capital is lacking. So if someone, uh, Mr. Bechertheim, if you have venture capital, uh, rather you than the ministry, we have to invest. Of course, our ministry invests. We've launched a, a fund for young, innovative people to provide funding for mobility startups, which is 60% of those um, in this German startup uh, community. We try to provide funding so that these people do not have to think about funding and about procuring money. They know that they can stay in Berlin or Munich and have the same financial possibilities. We have launched an M-Cloud, a mobility cloud, where mobility data, which can be provided to everyone, is made available to everyone free of charge. I think public data should be open data, and that's one of my hobby horses. And The Ministry of Transport is also responsible for whether the German weather service is part of my uh, remit. And I think uh, all the data, which is much more than shown on the 8 o'clock news, should be made available to everyone. It's a clever approach, but then you find that there is a large opposition. Why? Because there are interest groups who do not want to make this data available to everyone free of charge. And I think in the next legislative term, a lot remains to be done in this field. Our data must be available to the people, to innovative companies. That's the only way to launch innovation. Only then can someone with an idea actually develop a product, make it a global company. And that is why the large companies, you know, amongst the top five in the world. An interesting analysis, if you find that 10 years ago, the top five were General Electric, Exxon, Microsoft, Citigroup, British Petrol, BP, the large companies in about 10 years ago, which is not a long time. And if you look at that today, none of them is amongst the top 10 Microsofts, yes. But the traditional ones not dealing with data and information technology, they are no longer part of the top group. It's Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook. Those are the top five companies in the world. And why are they so much interested in the startup community? And if someone has an, a good instinct, they want to make them part of the group because they're not afraid of the large companies in the group. They are afraid of the small ones who have the innovative ideas because if they are confident, stay in Germany and say, I develop it here and I don't go to one of the large groups, all of a sudden it become, can become dangerous to large groups. I think it's, it's a positively dangerous idea because I am really optimistic and very much adhered to competition. I believe it's part of our society, a healthy competition, and it's therefore good to support young people enabling them to develop their products in Germany. You will find that uh, more challenges are related to this, that more has to be done, and we can address that with confidence once we've analyzed the situation and are less skeptical. I was born in 1970, so I'm not 
the old generation, and at that time, I very much benefited uh, the opportunity the previous generation um, opened up to us. And if I take political decisions, I think about whether this will this decision will open up an opportunity to the next generation or be an obstacle for the next generation. Ladies and gentlemen, unless we are confident and are determined to innovate and promote digitalization, invest all our efforts in this in the next legislative term, we will do away with the opportunities for the next generation. And that's our task. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Now, you mentioned the next generation. I was asking myself, my um, daughter is currently taking her driving lessons, and um, I was asking myself whether this makes sense or whether I should rather pay for a programming course. Very nice bridge to the next um, panel. We talked about the big companies, and now we want to talk about the SMEs because they are the big um, value creators in Germany, and they are going through a lot of change as well, more than um, might be obvious at first glance. But we're talking about this in the coming panel, and then you will also get the opportunity to ask questions. I'm asking Elke Eckstein, Axel Eigenstetter. Where is he? I hope he's still with us. And Mr. Leimbrock to join me on the stage. And Mr. Jatzombeck as a representative of um, politics and Mr. Pfeiffer, who's also not here. Oh, oh, here he is, yes. Okay, Mr. Eigenstetter, here you are. Great. Now, find your seats on the panel. And there's Mr. Jatzombeck. Everything is all right. I do understand that it's quite hectic in this last um, week of the Bundestag being in session. So we heard that we do have reason to be self-confident, that we shouldn't put our heads into the sand. And let's look at where we're already seeing a lot of going on. Let me introduce the panelists. Elke Eckstein is with us. She is with the Weidmüller Group and is board member responsible for the value chain. And she used to be with Osram and worked in France. Um, the United States and Taiwan, so she's seen more than just Germany, and she's now Chief Digital Officer, so she can tell us a little bit about her company. Then we have Matt Axel Eigenstetter, who um, owns a very um, classic um, company. He's a um, He owns a, own, owns a joinery, and they bought a big um, robot, and I looked at it, and it's quite interesting to see how um, this robot works, and you are a managing director of the um, joinery Eigenstädter in Mecklenburg, Westphalia, Rhenia, and you were um, chosen to uh, you were elected company of the year 2015. And then we have Andre Leimbrock, who is the um, clerical um, managing director of Dynamic Components GmbH. It's a startup. You used to be a um, founding consultant or startup consultant at the Technical University in Munich, so you um, have some experience in that field. I've already introduced Mr. Yard Sombeck and Dr. Joachim Pfeiffer, spokesperson for economic policy of the parliamentary group. So we like to welcome all of you, and we're going to talk about the cooperation of industry and politics. But first, we'd like to get a little understanding of how you do digitization in your company. Ms. Eckstein. <coughs> now, Weidmüller Group is a medium-sized family-owned business. We have about 4,500 employees about 700 million euros in um, turnover. We're a top company in the field of um, industrial joining, and we have a very strong brand grown <coughs> from history. Um, it became known um, because of um, plastics isolated um, clamps. We changed a lot. Digitization is important. Our products, solu solutions, or, or let's say components and solutions can be found wherever data, signal, energy is either connected or transferred. So we create these um, joining links. We're currently going through a big change process. We 
um, are developing from a component manufacturer to a um, solutions provider in digitization, and we move from electrification via automation into digitization. Now, what does that mean in concrete terms? We pursue a dual strategy. This strategy is that we are providers of industry 4.0 solutions, i.e. digitization solutions, and on the other hand, we're also um, a plier. So we are provider and a plier because and, and that's quite good because everything we offer to our customers is tested, tried, and applied by ourselves. The benefit that we offer to our customers, that's why we're doing what we're doing, is something we also want to experience ourselves. So that means better processes, higher level of efficiency, better um, competitiveness. And when I say we're offering solutions, this means that we um, offer digital business models. Together with our customers, we develop preventive maintenance, monitoring systems, energy monitoring, for example. These are the main areas of application. And in our own applications, we're currently using AR remote maintenance. We have our um, maintenance department in Detmold in um, Ostwestfalen whereas the factory is in Romania and the technicians through digital augmented reality systems actually operate the machine in Romania. And it is my goal to network all of the um, factories so that the self-optimized or self-controlled factory can be put into practice. As a family-owned company, we have the big advantage as a provider, and that brings me to the end, because we're very close to the customer. This is one of our big advantages. And the question of how customers can get their hands on uh, the data, i.e. analytics and application technology, can be very nicely combined. And we can quickly and strongly help the customers and, as a consequence, provide this dynamic and um, flexible level of digitization. When did that start? When did you notice that you need to get on board of this digitization train? Well, we call ourselves um, early adopters. We were very um, early on board. Um, we've been involved in this for five to ten years now. We're advancing this topic. It's always being said that the SMEs are rather timid and um, lagging behind and don't act as a driver. But we are among the trailblazers here, and um, we very much focus on innovation, education, and employment and work. And we cannot do that in isolation. And that's what SMEs have learned now, that they have to work um, together, be represented in bodies and forums, that they really have to come together and then advance through different organizations. Did you have somebody who helped you, or did you have a role model, somebody or something that you um, were able to learn from, or did you do all of that in isolation? I cannot really say that because I haven't been around for that long. But as I said, we started with electrification and then went through automation into digitization. Electrification means that we're um, components manufacturer. And this is an area where there is a lot of competition and where a lot of competition also comes from low wage regions. And we looked at a way of um, differentiating ourselves so that we could continue to exist and, and continue to manufacture in Europe and provide an additional value to the customers. So um, advanced integration was the buzzword here, and that means um, digitization. Now, Mr. Eigenstetter, you said you're a classic joinery, but then at some point you thought, well, there's something that we need to change. How did you do that? In our case, we like to play around a lot. And we're the smallest company here. And um, Mr. Bechholt gave the bird's view of digitization. And we, as a comparison, more or less provide the frog's view. Um, you can clearly see what um, 
industrial uh, industrialization 4.0 um, is as a term it's big um, everything can be put under this label the most disruptive technologies and developments and ev evolutionary um, developments in um, the carpentry and joinery business I mean that's what we really have to um, say in our case we clearly notice that if you start to use new technologies and new tools once um, it's quite I mean we work for um, to some group Marines we do some modeling for them for Airbus we do some modeling which is quite unusual for a joinery but this is due to the fact that if you get started once you have to um, ensure a certain level of coherence you have to create coherence for better or worse and when doing that, you learn certain things. Now, if I think of the um, Disney presentation and um, 3D data, and this is what we're working with day in and day out. So com complicated data needs to be transferred into the company. We need to be able to process them and translate it into a physical product. And we do that. Can, can, can you take a step back? Um, for all of us who don't know exactly what it is that you're doing, what did you do? How did you um, change your company? Well, the biggest thing um, was we use a big um, KUKA robot um, for um, some of the milling work that we're doing. Um, the, the, the machine production is now done by a big um, robot and a documentary was made um, because of this and, and it's a very nice um, topic and which led to a lot of um, public relations um, which we probably don't um, deserve but we have this big robot now and we also work with um, the conventional five axle um, machines that we can now operate better because of this robot now, are you um, still a carpenter or are you more of a programmer where well, we need the handyman because we mostly um, produce prototypes. We also um, produce the prototypes, but the product is the prototype in our case because we only do bespoke products. So you've made positive experiences with digitization. Now, if I remember the slides that um, said everything will be better, I don't know. From the frog's perspective, things might be um, looking a little differently. I'm, I'm a skeptic by nature. You just have to be on board, um, be disruptive instead of being uh, disrupted um, is my motto. But that's the difference between the carpenter and the Silicon Valley billionaire, the fact that I'm more skeptical. OK, but we have the um, medium-sized um, carpenter here, and we want to talk about that. So are there certain things where um, you want to have your um, joinery from 15 years ago back? Well, I studied, and I already was a disruptive element when joining the company. So um, wishing the old times back is something that's quite difficult for me. But romanticizing um, joineries is one thing. It's also um, this romanticizing of the past, but the past is the past, and it's not practical to think about that. So I can answer that by saying no. Now, Mr. Um, Langwood, can you tell me a little bit about um, your company? You um, work on improving the punctuality of the German railroads. Um, we're all happy about that, but tell us how do you do that? No, that's not entirely correct. But that's what I read in this um, internet thing. Well, that is correct. We do work with Deutsche Bahn, but when it comes to infrastructure, i.e. elevators and escalators. But there was a little video clip where they said um, certain um, switch um, repairs can be forecast, so that increases punctuality. Yes, we work together with another startup here, but our main core competence currently is retrofitting of sensors and um, equipments and devices um, with regard to escalators and elevators. Um, we heard that they frequently fail as well and that this is a nuisance for Deutsche Bahn. And yes, that's what we're doing. But we try to help our customer with regard to improving maintenance cycles and also um, realize new business models. I wasn't only a startup consultant, but also a company consultant. And I saw in bigger companies how digitization can 
look like, how it works. And I sometimes ask myself whether digitization might be the wrong term. In the uh, presentation by Mr. Bechlerotsheim, we heard that Facebook, Apple, and Google are the big, new, valuable companies. And when you look at it, um, their products were entirely new. Their in industries were entirely new um, when they were created. So a digital platform is rather the dimension that we should be thinking in and not the idea of taking something that already exists and introduce it into the, in uh, into the internet through digitization. Um, you don't have to cannibalize your old um, products. Um, Apple introduced the um, iPad pod and they cannibalized themselves with the introduction of the iPhone and a normal company wouldn't have done that. So new business models for old industries, question mark. We try to implement that by retrofit um, sensors um, and so old machines can use new data and um, or can use data to produce something new. Okay, and who supported you in um, getting to where you're at now? Well, first, the Technical University of um, Munich with the um, Unternehmertum um, founding and startup network, which is financially very nicely equipped um, because of Ms. Susanne Klatten, um, main shareholder of BMW, and also other partners like the Federal um, Ministry of Economic Affairs. That should not be forgotten. We are the product of a research um, um, project of the Technical University of um, Munich. We did a, a research transfer. Um, supported by the um, Ministry of Economic Affairs and Deutsche Bahn also helped us to develop our product further. Um, they also have a, a startup unit um, here in Berlin at Janowitz Brücke. So they're already quite digital and they helped us to understand um, how a big um, company acts and thinks and they also helped us to open um, certain doors. So we had a good way of um, reaching out to our customers. So public and private capital was used to support you. Yes, only public funds don't help you. You have to cooperate with big companies so that you can, at the end of the day, um, make use of the economies of scale and hire people. But we had um, support from both sides. Mr. Pfeiffer, how can you help medium-sized companies? Um, how can you prepare them for digitization? Well, I think digitization starts with the minds, uh, with, with the companies, but also politics. And we have to rethink, we have to think about how to, uh, how to find new ways. Um, this legislative term, we set the legal framework for, procure, for electronic procurement. And I think um, procurement and a level playing field in Germany at European level or even if internationally is more relevant than for large companies who have large uh, legal departments. If you look at the EU Commission and Google, they have been doing this for a longer time and will continue to debate and they can afford to do that, which the medium-sized companies cannot. And uh, that applies to a basic uh, um, regulation on data protection. We still had uh, a clause that the written form was compulsory for many things. If you apply for a passport, you have to go there in person, have to take your fingerprints, and you have to repeat that with the next passport because every fingerprint is just recorded for this very one passport and not for the next one. And this is the topic. We want to establish a level playing field. And as Minister Dobrindt said, uh, it's about infrastructure. We need framework conditions to have um, a more intelligent playing field. When it comes to infrastructure, it's a permanent task. Uh, a road is planned and built, and then it stays there for 30, 40 years. You need some repairs, but it stays as such. When it comes to broadband, a few years ago, we talked about one Mbit, and many believed that uh, digitalization was that, but it continues to be permanent talk. We now have 50 gigabit, then we have 100 as a target for this legislative period, and we are still in it this week. We had 50 Mbit, or 100. So, what becomes clear is things are changing, uh, latency, speed, in intelligence, etc. The third point is 
that we need staff employees. The labor laws cannot be directly applied to digitalization. What we need is new approaches, approaches and I think uh, the digitalization provides medium-sized companies in particular with new software and possibilities, not only for companies but also for staff in companies and provides them with an opportunity um, to compete with large companies in the, the competition for skilled labor. The fourth point is research and development, where we do quite a bit. We have the high-tech strategy and um, a lot of funds are provided for that. We try to um, have the necessary networks and the cluster development. And that is the atmosphere where medium-sized companies can develop further and for medium-sized companies can be supported by universities, networking, etc. And the fifth point has already been addressed, that's funding. And uh, currently, when it comes to startups and founding, we have launched a program together with We Development Bank, and we decided to focus on a growth funding because we're lagging behind in this field in the international competition. We don't think everything has to be done by the state, but EAP funds, Marshall Plan funds provided. Um, 200 million will be provided, which are leveraged by a factor of two at least, and they can be used in a targeted way through contributions outside the traditional KFW setting to fund growth and, uh, and others where we found that there's a great need for action. So these are just five points where we have taken considerable action during this legislative term. And uh, we're on the way to the next uh, elections and of course we will continue along those lines. You said digitization starts with the minds, but then has to be implemented. Ms. Eckstein, would you say that despite of the political framework conditions, you made great progress in digitization or because of the framework conditions? With the political framework conditions, of course. But I would like to take up two points nonetheless. So we invest a lot of time and money in training and continued training. Uh, when it comes to Industry 4.0 and uh, when it comes to digitalization of networks. I said at the beginning that they are tremendously important at a national and international level. To, in future, we will differentiate through software and um, continue to training in companies be too slow. I cannot train any software experts, so I hope that universities worked closer to application. And the second topic, which you already mentioned, is working hours. We need a flexibility regarding flexibility and mo mobility. We've been debating a lot with our software developers. They don't start at 7 or 8 in the morning, and they don't go home after 8 hours. And this will continue to be our challenge, Fujo. Well, how do they do that? When do they turn up at work? Round the clock or turn up at 11? We have digitalization, remote maintenance, business models so that we enable our staff to operate machines from at home or in other countries. And this no longer works from a fixed um, place in an office. I hope I'm hoping for open working time models, which is not up to me, so that my developers can work whenever they want to. I hope that those operating machines work when it, there's a breakdown, but that means that they need round o'clock availability. And many say that there's a threat of exploitation. Yes, of course, that's a relevant issue. You're right. 
but are they available around, around the clock? Today, we solve this by working in a shift model, but uh, fixed models. And I believe this will no longer work in the future because it's no longer affordable. There's a, a difference between totally autonomous flexible systems and fixed working models. How do you solve the problem with, in, in the joinery and in the startup, Mr. Leinbock? Do you work around the clock as founder? It's difficult to draw a line. If I read emails on the weekend, is that work? I think as an entrepreneur, you always work. Of course, we adhere to legislation when it comes to working hours. But if people claim to be uh, freelancers, uh, what is relevant to us is to set the documents providing the right contract and making sure that they are not uh, secretly employed by us. And uh, politics could help us here um, in this field so that information technology specialists who want to work as freelancers, they don't want to work in-house. They want to work for different customers, want to work over the weekend, etc. And I hope that politics supports us in um, monitoring this. Mr. Eigenstetter, what about you? Do you work eight hours? There's a certain stability. A lot depends on cooperation. So people will have to work at the same time. You cannot provide such uh, great flexibility as with other companies. They, they have to work as a team. And I don't know whether flexibility is always the uh, ultima ratio. Um, so another point which is very important to me is um, close uh, application orientation of a uh, training, uh, which is relevant to a craftsperson, but when we talk about this, when we want disruption, we want independent thinkers, we want basic training, the very basic training, mathematics. If I think about the mathematics uh, I learned at, at the University Linear Algebra, uh, which I thought would never crop up again last year, we had a large problem of um, um, Palace for for ships in the military field. Um, maybe IT specialists know about the problems. I would never would have thought that I would have to deal with these topics again. So I'm very much in favor of basic training, training the fundamentals, because that's the sound basis for independent reason. So not too close to application. I think this is important. Can you go into further details? What basics need? Mathematics and natural science is, of course, what we are talking about, but also in the humanities. Why not? The, the arts. Um, I wouldn't say that uh, universities of applied sciences do only have to train for f four companies. Because we do not know about the future, the world is becoming more and more volatile. No one knows what people we need in two years' time. So we need um, all-rounders with maximum flexibility that are not trained for a specific application. But that's my very personal opinion. Mr. Jetzomek, what do you say? When we look at the labor law issues, In this legislative term, we have decisions that make it more difficult. Our coalition partner forced us to do so, when, particularly when it comes to um, flexi-time workers, uh, uh, that after 18 months, you have to provide a fixed-term contract and no longer lease workers. And uh, if the job is not concluded, they need a break of three months in order, in order to continue their work after the three month break. I think that's absurd, and we will have to change that in the future because there's a change in trends. 
Ms. Nalis believes that a powerful company and you have a powerless employee or staff, but in particular, when it comes to information technology, labor markets are buyer's markets, and the company is powerless and the qualified staff is highly qual um, powerful, and that is what we have to draw a line and say that all these rules apply to those who, who actually need to be protected. Apparently, this meets with consent. So let's stick with the topic of jobs. Many are afraid that they're not fit for the digitalization. Mr. Lambok, are you a growing company, although you're small, but do you create jobs? Yes, definitely. I don't know whether you're small and then we, we have a five, a staff of five. We create jobs and we want to create jobs. When it comes to innovation and jobs, one month ago I visited Deutsche Telekom at an event and this chief innovation officer showed a slide from the United Kingdom, but quite representative, which gives the percentage of employment between 1300, uh, the printing, first printing, and modern times, which was constant. Despite of all disruptions, the number of employees stayed more or less the same, with some ups and downs, but more or less the same. I think digitization and the new technologies means that we need it will provide the same number of jobs, more or less, but we have different job profiles. Ten years ago, someone asked whether you wanted to become an online marketing manager, and no one would have known what this is all about. While it's a big industry today, in the 19th century, uh, if you uh, asked a coachman whether he wanted to drive a, a car, he, he wouldn't have known about a car and what to do with his horses. I think new jobs are created by the new industries with a changing qualification profile. We have to take care to not leave behind those who are not highly qualified, but maybe politics um, should become active here to regulate this. Ms. Eckstein, how do you create jobs? Well, in the same way, we see a trend towards more highly qualified jobs. Today, machines are operated and will be um, uh, controlled in future. Um, it is a challenge to to continue training those who are less well qualified. What we do is communicate a lot, show a lot what's going on. It's part of the strategy, how we try to digitalize. We take it step by step in a very evolutionary process to show that no one has to be afraid of industry 4.0, so it's very tangible for our staff, and I think it's very important to take everyone on board. It was a good incentive to eradicate those fears in our company. We invest a lot in communication, that's us, the, the management of the company, but also with our social partners, um, the metal workers, uh, union, uh, the works councils, etc. So it's a joint approach. So we choose to take everyone on board. And can you employ more people because you're digitized? Yes, we employ more people, but better skilled people. And since we've been talking about working hours and uh, the corresponding act, do you see a large resistance by the trade unions? Well, we're not that far yet. In our applications, everything works quite well. Try trade unions debate with us. Um, they know that this is on the agenda, but we haven't seen any solutions yet. I think we have to continue our talks and develop joint models. But um, I see that all sides are very open. Mr. Eigenstetter, were you able to hire more people? Was it easy to find the skilled staff? Well, it is not easy to find qualified staff. It's a challenge to keep people in the crafts and, of course, to set the financial framework to keep them. Why do people want to go somewhere else? 
industry provides more money or pays more money, and we have to try to keep up with that. Um, so we have to try to, to keep abreast with industry in terms of technology, but also with payment. And do you manage to keep your older staff on board? It's sometimes difficult. You know everyone on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And if it's not possible, you try to leave people be. And, and definitely there are areas where they can. It's not, we're not only working with robots. And there are some who do traditional value average, and that's OK. But you have a, if you have a vision of your company, you say it would be helpful to, to employ another 20 if I found the people who, who had the skills, or wouldn't it be helpful and it's good to stay small? Helmut Schmidt said that those physicians should visit a doctor and CDC is here. Okay, I'm sorry about that, but I think everyone appreciates Mr. Schmidt. That's okay. And then, and the Fisher said, and the co company consultant comes and says, and you can do more, you can do more. And say, what? Even I have a company and the fabric. What can I do? Well, you can sit around and not do anything. That's what I'm doing now. Well, unlimited growth would not be helpful for us. There might be a necessary growth, um, a certain line you have to cross, but future will show. Ms. Eichstein, what about your company? Would it be helpful to keep your company at a certain size to be flexible, or would it be good to be bigger in order to invest in a different way? We have a good size to be flexible. My answer is what we show our staff, that industry 4.0 digitalization can facilitate their work, carrying heavy loads, etc. So we are in a lucky situation that we have a company of the size that those who can, uh, that if staff cannot be trained, etc., we can shift them to workplaces that are less demanding, and we have more of those than a small company. Mr. Leinborg, would you say that small companies have an advantage over larger companies, and it's helpful to have many small companies that network? It's more helpful than one large company? I think we have certain advantages. We are more agile. We have, uh, it can take uh, decisions more quickly. We co collaborate with many small companies, but collaborating with large companies is also helpful. I mentioned German Telecom. They help us in getting access to our customers. We collaborate with specialized analyzing tools. But we also want to grow because uh, motivated staff, which is difficult to find, um, we cannot provide a lot to motivated people. We cannot pay much, but if they can quickly reach a manager position, that's only possible if we continue to grow, go to different new countries, etc. And I think there's no other way to, to attract high potentials than giving them responsible tasks. I would like to open the debate to the floor and give you the opportunity to ask your questions. Please use the microphones and briefly introduce yourself. My name is Lukas Goetz. I've just been to, to Tel Aviv. I had the opportunity to work in program development for startups and companies. And we collaborated also with Knesset. My question to Mr. Jatzombek and Mr. Pfeiffer. We heard a lot about the role of politics to set framework conditions for medium sized companies, etc. And how far do you think about not only providing framework conditions, but becoming a driver of innovation? Mr. Dobrindt mentioned this by providing data. 
before creating conditions for companies, we have to create these conditions within the state as such that the state is innovative. I could also see that many private companies um, push into the areas of responsibility of the state education, for example, there are education platforms which provide technologies which the state funded models of schools do not fully exclude, but which are an alternative to them. I mentioned electronic procurement and others. I think we have to become a model when it comes to application and practical implementation. We failed in the past when I look at the health carta and other applications. Uh, the federal system in Germany was not always helpful. 16 federal lenders, 16 different approaches, and 20,000 different municipalities, um, and 20,000 different priorities. With most recent reform of the financial relations between federal government and lender, we agreed to have uh, standardized portals where everyone coordinates. I think that's the first step to become more active in this field. And I think the state, the government, can become a pacemaker when it comes to specific applications, bringing them close to the citizens, but also close to business. It must continue to be one of our main tasks to become uh, more quick in this field. I think we've laid the foundation. Why haven't you been so very fast in the past? You talked about the federal system. Well, apparently, uh, the problem is practical implementation. I mentioned that many things had to be provided in writing. If a digital file can no longer no, not be used as such, but you need a signature in person. You have to um, sample data several times. No one understands that. I don't understand why we have to do that. Did you go to a municipality and every time you have to fill in the same papers and you every, every time you have to provide your bank account number and no one knows what the other departments do, not because they're not willing, but because for data protection reasons, it's not possible to provide data to other departments. First approaches are the tax declarations that are already filled in by the tax offices. Uh, we have to gather speed in this field, and we need a social debate on uh, data protection. I helped with the um, with many of the statistics in the past, and uh, some of these points no longer uh, apply. I was part of the census um, when I was a student and helped to assemble data, and many of these data protection guidelines are no longer helpful. So we are lagging behind, definitely. What we tell companies is something we have to tell ourselves. We have to think as a platform economy. The state in the past often made the mistakes of uh, doing everything itself. With all processes, uh, we need interfaces for e-government and uh, must provide uh, space for experts when it comes to the front and startups, etc. This legislative period, we adopted the Open Data Act that uh, provides the possibility to provide open access data. The new ID card was adopted, which is also a means of authentication for all other ones. If I um, have a contact with a drive now car sharing, I can open the car with that. But it was introduced uh, a few years ago, but the hardware was too complicated. Well, yeah, we changed the act four weeks ago, and everyone now has this function, you can use it with your mobile phone, you no longer need a reader, and we want uh, this to be seen as a platform, as Mr. Pfeiffer said, if you want to provide e-government for 100% of the people, there will always be some who say they don't want that for um, data protection reasons, and that what we that's why we want to have a, a profile, and if 
you consent to have the data data stored with the government. Uh, the data is available, and you don't have to fill in all this data time and again. Mr. Eckstein, you answering as an, a user of digitization, and I said the Elena, what you meant, Israel, Korea, the successful countries have a very active industrial policy, and I would like to know what your answer is to that. If you want to become a driver of digitization, I think it starts with uh, the term industry 4.0 um, is interpreted differently in all fields. And I think a very active industrial policy, for example, like the one in Israel, or the other countries I mentioned, would be extremely helpful. I mentioned two topics, blockchain and artificial intelligence are the ones where we have to invest as the government. And the question is, what is the target? The example of the AI startups in the United States and China, etc. Uh, we don't have them in Germany. Um, maybe we should set the target of 100 AI startups with a minimum volume of whatever, and then we have to discuss the related measures. I think we have to do something where we're strong. I think we have the unique opportunity to process intelligence and knowledge, which we have in the crafts and production in medium-sized companies that should be linked to digitalization. Other countries don't have that opportunity. And to implement that is certainly a key. That's why we need training. It has already been mentioned. We need to adapt our dual training. but because I have to maintain it. In 2009, for the first time ever, we had more students than apprentices. I don't want to judge on that. Everyone can think about the personal situation. Everyone has to decide for themselves. But now we have 60%, and we believe it will grow to 75% students. So we have less and less apprentices, and we must take care that we don't le lose the uh, process intelligence, which is very important. The Chinese found that copying alone is not enough, be it legal or illegal, and that's why they go into companies to learn about processes and um, do bottom-up innovation. It takes approximately 15 years, I'd say, and we have a competitive edge towards most other countries in the world. That's another question from Flo. Patricia Solaro from German Electronics Industry. We've been discussing this for three hours, and one topic has not been mentioned very much, and that's cybersecurity. My question to Ms. Eckstein is, how far do you understand cybersecurity as an A-label? In a current survey of the electronics industry, we found that cybersecurity for medium-sized companies is one of the main obstacles. Thank you. The solutions we provide is, is open platform solutions. The components we provide can communicate. We call them cyber secure, but the topic you address, that of data security, um, it's one of the main topics. And I think we cannot provide any absolute security, we work as secure as possible in local clouds, in the cloud, we have firewalls, but there will not always be 100% security. Is that an issue for your staff? It is. We provide a lot of training along those lines, try to make sure that we always have updated virus scanners and invest a lot in our in our staff. So an additional point that has to be paid for that you have to invest in. Mr. Leinbock, do you have any ideas on how to improve cybersecurity for medium-sized companies? Yes, we process many companies on our equipment in, on, in the field so that uh, many sensitive data does not even leave the, the plant and it's not given to the cloud. If you have acoustic sensors, who record sounds or talks, 
which they shouldn't. The data is processed immediately. It's not um, stored in the cloud, so you always know where your data is. It is important to our customers that this uh, runs on their own servers and not with Microsoft or Amazon, and that's what we provide. Within the company's own infrastructure, we provide a, a safe data storage. Are there any further questions? I'm a uh, journalist from Chile. I have a brief question. In how far do you think major changes uh, or major developments in the United States um, have turned out as successful as they are because of the visions in the United States doing better with better with digitalization, the election campaigns is highly digitalized, and Germany is lagging behind in this field. You're certainly right. The success of Germ uh, United States companies much depends on, on visions. I think visions are important to a specific point. They're good at doing marketing even with semi-finished solutions. They sell that to customers and then they continue to develop. I found that with my background of uh, startup counseling. We are good um, when it comes to inventing, but we are not very good at marketing. We have to improve in this field. My co-founder a few months ago said, two years ago, we put in our business plan, we have to become better known to marketing. He said, I finally understand what you mean when you talk about becoming better now. Well, you're here now. Well, I'm grateful for getting this opportunity and also to Presenting my company, we can become better known. We do marketing, we have a vision, but also good products and good technology. And I think that's what makes up success. I agree, but I also think large difference to the United States is our culture of learning and making mistakes. You say fail early, learn fast, or the other way around. In the United States, when you fail, if you fail with your company, it's not necessarily negative. It's part of a learning process. And I think digitization learns from trying out things, uh, um, making progress gradually, and learning from mistakes. In Germany, we have a different culture. If you failed, um, if you're bank bankrupt, it's, uh, it's always a stain. And uh, we have to learn to understand this different. It's, it's OK to, to, to fail, and that you have to try out new things. Mr. Eigenstetter, you wanted to take the floor. I've never been involved in the United States in a business context, but I like to travel there a lot. What I find is the Maverick culture. The uh, a Maverick is someone who joins the herd, but is not branded. But if you look around here, who stands out? I hate to wear shoes in this weather. You can really believe that I uh, put on shoes even uh, simply be even Oxfords simply because I I I think uh, other people would think well who uh, uh, but there's just one who dared to to wear but I think that's for health reasons well whatever but yeah it, yes it's part of the cliche those are good German Birkenstocks. I think in the United States, uh, the outsiders are m more appreciated, so there's less pressure to become a conformity. Yes, diversity well, has become pejorative in a way. We talked about what we have achieved. We, you said we can be confident. Many things are doing well. and. Mr. Sommer, you said that there are things on your agenda. Is digitization a topic for election campaign? Does it work? Well, I'm convinced of that. It decided many elections from Brexit to the US, US elections, <laughs> and you would be stupid not to use that. In the Northern Westphalia elections, we had a social media strategy with 700 uh, 
different pictures for target groups. It's an important issue. And of course, you think about content for your election campaign platform. Uh, you think about platforms, where to find target group and what to, th to provide for them. It's not a new way of thinking, but there are new target groups, which I didn't have before. Uh, but the question is, is the, is the fact that society changes a contributing factor, but it, or is it about um, jobs, etc.? Well, it's good that things that that we are doing well in Germany. We have three hundred thousand new jobs in Germany net every year, and everyone says that they are afraid of losing a job, but there are new jobs all the time. So economic policy issues are not very high on the agenda. It's a rather a question of distribution because we are doing so well at the moment. And that's also one of the problems of industry. If a diesel engine is on, uh, on a peak, uh, uh, Volkswagen will not become disrupted, or not in the way you expect it to. And maybe it's also up to the government because our administration is so complicating with the ID card and then we had the refugees crisis. On all of a sudden, you combined eight databases, had a new refugee ID, and all domestic, uh, all politicians responsible for interior policy said it's cool, but uh, and we wanted want that for all Germans. But we needed a disruption in this field, Mr. Pfeiffer. How can we promote disruption to make progress? Well, we cannot uh, decide that we have to disruption in, in the German Bundestag. It's not a Bundestag decision. So um, the truth um, always depends on specific applications. And uh, the data issue will have to be discussed. The, the example of Thomas Jatzombeck is relevant only because nothing works with, with, worked with the refugees and they were registered five times. There was a certain willingness to combine databases. And apparently this seems to be imminent to the human nature, even at a digital age. Uh, people are only willing to change things when there's a sufficient pressure. When you look at Agenda 2010, 15 years, we've debated that. Everyone knows what is possible, and in the end, we didn't do it. And only when pressure was extremely high, we're willing to do that. I hope that our friends in France uh, see the same. And I hope that we will have an Agenda 2030 and start or try to implement things that are necessary now to move in the right direction. so that we do not only start moving when we have more unemployed and less economic growth, etc. It's a shame that we are often unable to benefit from economic upswings. And, um, it's very difficult in the current coalition. They want to, to distribute. Who would make it easier? Well, we don't need anyone else, basically, <laughs> to make this very clear. Okay. In the, uh, but you take the CSU on board, yes, of course. But on the labor market, digitization, we have all experts in, in the uh, CDU, CSU, so we could do it on our own and uh, maintain diversity. We're expecting the federal chancellor in a moment. But Mr. Leimbrock, uh, just imagine we met again in four years' time and uh, Angela Merkel was still federal chancellor, and uh, you implemented some things. What would be better? I don't know what would be better. I would certainly hope for the following a burden to us as a young company is all the regulations, taxes. We have to uh, provide uh, taxes in a very complicated manner. Why? Can startups not be exempt from taxes for three years to see whether things work out? In the end, you have created jobs and the company's up and running, and then you can start with the taxes. I don't know about uh, the the plus 
in, in Texas. So the, the, the few millions you take from startups could be invested by saying that startups do not uh, exempt from taxes in the startup phase. And that would enable um, entrepreneurs to, to launch a company, start with a company, and uh, to start working right away. So the culture of failure, the question of whether the culture of failure could be promoted through taxes. Do you, do you want to, to answer that? Well, we are we too, we're certainly in favor of that. The Federal Chancellor is here now. Who <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, might uh, even say that we have that in our election platform, but no. Um, it would be helpful to lessen the burden, uh, the bureaucratic burden for startups. Other possibilities of funding, tax uh, f reduction for uh, research and companies is on the agenda, for example. But we have to adopt new things in a way that they match the overall system. Um, we had startups uh, and we provided 20,000 euros in the end. It didn't work out in the way we expected. A redistribution by the state is not a panacea. We hope that innovations provide incentives for the labor market, for entrepreneurs, so that entrepreneurs become active in their field, develop innovations, and if they make money in the end, they can pay taxes, but in a way that they still like to work in Germany. I would like to add a specific point. We mentioned the blockchain in North Westphalia. We have a, a one blockchain process for public administration in North Westphalia and a collision treatment that could be um, value added tax and that would facilitate things a lot and would uh, lessen the burden for companies. Thank you very much. Is there anything you hope uh, are wishing for the next legislative term? I think I addressed everything, industrial policy, education, and flexible working hours. Mr. Engstetter, no. You're happy, I said. OK, thank you. We have a happy joiner who uh, works in the digitalized industry 4.0. Thank you very much for the debate. And thank you for providing all ideas to politics. Thank you very much. Well, we just heard the panel discussion, and we're now looking forward to what the federal chancellor has to say. And I can tell you, um, the person sitting next to you, Mr. von um, Bergshaber, said that we do not have to hide. A lot of things are going quite well in um, Germany. We've seen that with the big and the small companies in Germany. So Industry 4.0 has reached Germany. So we're looking forward to what you have to say, please welcome the Federal Chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany, Angela Merkel. Michael Fox, dear colleagues, guests of this conference, now Michel Merkel towards the end means that most things have already been said by people who are a lot more of an expert than I am. So my presence here has to be understood in a way that shows that I believe that this is something that needs to be dealt with at the top level. Um, we look at digitization as a contribution to the affluence of tomorrow, wealth of tomorrow, and the parliamentary party groups, including the CDU, CSU, have focused on this topic as a priority for this term in office, and it will also determine the next term in office. 4.0, as an abbreviation, has been linked to the term industry for many years, but Michael Fuchs, I 
like it that this conference focuses on focusing on Germany 4.0. And at the end of the day, this only means that digitization will have an impact on all areas of life, will change all areas of life. And in such a conference, you cannot discuss all of these areas. There are so many changes in um, society, our entire way of communicating. Look at people sitting around a dinner table. They look at their plates. They occasionally also talk to the person sitting next to them. But a lot of things also happen with third parties not present at the table. And that's just a little bit of what's happening. I remember when we um, initiated Platform Industry 4.0, that was at um, the Hanover Fair in 2015. India was our partner country at that time. And they already talked about the digital agenda. India and digital transformation was something they were trying to advance in India. And I think in the past years, we were able to catch up in many ways. We um, set up a working group, the so-called IT summits, or as they're now called, the digital summits that we organize every year. And different working groups cooperate with industry to identify existing problems and consequently solve them. By the way, this is a type of cooperation that we are not that familiar with um, in our classic um, type of cooperation between politics and industry associations. We usually go to meetings and um, then we tell each other what we expect the other party to do. But here we are breaking out into, well, I can't call it new territories anymore, but we are um, venturing out into things that are not known and we try to see what is possible and we need some guiding structures but um, shouldn't build up too many barriers. So we're um, trying this. With the Digital Summit, we focused on e-health um, the last time. That was the priority topic. The Minister of Health always tells me that the health card will be the big breakthrough here, so I'm not going to talk about how long it took for this to happen, but I think in that field we've seen a lot of things changing in hospitals. The opportunities with um, telemedicine are very clearly visible. The provision, um, service provision for rural areas has improved a lot. and. Treatment will become a lot more precise as well because access to data materi material is faster and there's a better way of making use of um, specialists and um, surgical um, techniques have also been linked very much to digitization. If you think of all of the endoscopic um, surgeries, artificial intelligence will play a big role here as well. So there is a lot of dynamism in this entire field. Now, we first and foremost have to look at the digital infrastructure because when that doesn't exist, all of the opportunities given by digitization will not be able to progress. We've um, set some important cornerstones here. In some of the statistics, we don't fare that well because our fiber optic um, networks aren't um, that well um, spread up. But we will achieve our um, goal of um, reaching five of all households with 5G. Um, we are working on expanding broadband in the rural areas where we believe it doesn't make um, sense to have um, 5G there. Um, but we have the stipulation in our constitution that all areas should be treated equal. And um, we will make um, broadband gigabit available um, from 2018 to 2005. And it's not only about um, residential areas, but also commercial areas. And Alexander Dobrindt, Minister for Infrastructure Affairs, has made some commitments here. In the next term in office, it will be about connecting schools to the grid because we um, already mentioned education, or you already mentioned education, and I'd like to take that up in a second again. And it's also about the availability of big broadband um, connectability along the um, um, infrastructure lines, um, because we might need that also for um, autonomous driving. So 4 billion euros have been made available for this. Um, the money um, is made use of, and there is a 
high willingness of the responsible stakeholders at the municipal level to take up the issue because everybody understands that this is a determining factor for Germany. As a minister, um, Alexander Dobrin um, founded the um, Grid Alliance Digital Germany and the future offensive um, Gigabit Germany will be started, as I just mentioned, and the technical um, standard 5G plays an important role here. Automatically, this leads us to the digital um, single market in Europe because it will be to achieve digital broadband connectivity across borders instead of um, having to stop whenever you cross a border, for example, if you want to advance um, with autonomous driving. The Grid Alliance um, for um, 2014 until 2023 has stipulated that there will be um, 100 billion euros of um, investments and our planning and construction capacities should not be overburdened because that will lead to um, price increases that we don't um, need. So the question of planning necessities and planning capacities is a lot of important uh, is um, a lot more important when it comes to investments than um, in the past. Now, if you ask why do we need the 5G standard? What do we need the gigabit availability for? The answer is quite clear. We need real time availability. People will connect. I mean, this has already happened, but a lot of things or almost all things will connect. That's why we are talking about the Internet of Things and they want to communicate with each other. When talking about production and logistics, they want to do that in um, as real time as possible. And with autonomous driving, um, this is of utmost importance. We're already entering the next step. Industry 4.0 is one thing. Digital production, digital factory is one thing. But the next um, level is focusing a lot more on what can be replaced by robotics or be made in cooperation with man or to which extent can robots become intelligent. So this entire buzzword of artificial intelligence will shape the next era. You're all familiar with this uh, from the side of consumer applications, this question of um, do I have to write or um, will the device recognize um, what I'm thinking? I mean, there are uh, a lot of interesting things along that line. Um, concentrated thinking can already lead to reactions from d digital um, entities, if I may call them that. Um, sometimes they're given human names and then they react to you're um, thinking, but a lot is going on in this direction already. So um, automated translation programs and um, logical sequencing of orders and the ability to learn from mistakes. These are all things that um, play a role not only with um, Czech computers, but they go far beyond that. When we see that more than 20% of our value is created in um, industry, it is of utmost importance for us whether we can lead this development in the field of the real industry, whether we can achieve that. And that's why we're making these efforts within the realm of Industry 4.0. Some of you might be familiar um, with this for me, but I always say development is important within the company, but the decisive interface will be that between the producer and the consumer, i.e. the customer, B2C or C2B, as it is said. And this is where the innovative leaders from the consumer industry meet the innovative leaders in the production industry and all German companies have to understand that their relations with the customers will change completely. If you know everything about the customer and their wishes, you will be able to turn us into the expanded workbench and they know less value added turnaround, uh, value added profits than those who um, master the entire um, value chain. So you have to have good, interesting offers for the customers. And they will not be, I have a great um, car or I have a great um, product. 
customers want to say, I want to go from A to B, and who can provide me with the platform that enables me to efficiently and positively get from A to B while taking into consideration my special wishes that maybe um, part of the route is done on a freeway and part is done with a bicycle so that all modes of transportation are offered on a platform. And there will be certain platforms that together with mobility also want to um, offer gifts for or um, gifts for the relatives that you want to visit or manage your um, bank account, etc. So multi-modal um, approaches. And is Germany's industry willing to create such a platform and um, think from the vantage point of the customer and to network in a way that these integrative offers can be made? And, and that's a question that I um, only came up with um, recently, is our antitrust legislation prepared for this so that we'll be able to um, do that? And those will be the most urgent questions because usually that's um, in the classic thinking of German antitrust um, legislation is called collusion and um, is um, illegal and for um, for for policymakers um, who are active in the field of um, economy, um, that might be uh, a nice thing to think about in the um, holidays that are coming up. I think there are new ways that we need to um, embark on. So for Germany's industry, um, mechanical engineering, automotive, and chemical industries, to just give you three buzzwords, we are seeing a lot of challenges. Particularly with a view to the automotive industry, we're seeing a situation where there are three revolutions taking place simultaneously that are also interconnected, one being automated driving, the, which requires um, digitization. As soon as automated driving becomes more relevant, the traffic in conurbations will focus more on the question of um, ownership and also of um, drives, um, the power of um, engines, the question of um, whether I can be the first to um, take off when the stop light shows green isn't that important anymore. When driving is um, automated, the question is how do I get from A to B in a safe way and not so much how um, do I get from A to B as quickly as possible. So the entire um, questions in that field will change and these three revolutions will have to be linked. And we as um, citizens have to be curious with a view to um, revolutions. And that is also um, very important when we are very much saturated, um, it means we're not that um, interested in these um, leapfrogging developments of the quality of products. Now, for all of these innovations, we need to create an environment that doesn't only provide a good environment for the classic SMEs, but also for the startups that approach things with an entirely different philosophy. In this um, term in office, we achieved quite a lot in um, harsh battles that were fought. Um, we, I, I cannot believe that um, so many people um, discussed for so many um, hours that um, certain problems were solved um, when um, company mergers occur, but we have um, achieved a situation that is now beneficial for um, startups. You also talked about the culture of um, failure. I don't mystify Pfeiffer whether you need to um, have tax breaks in place for failure, but it shouldn't be punished. There have to be um, loans for more than one um, attempt in starting a company. You um, shouldn't just be given one opportunity and then um, never be able to try it again. I am on your page when it comes to that. And then we have to define strategic areas um, that enable us to be um, lastingly successful in the field of digitization. The European Commission has identified certain um, strategic sectors where we are not required to um, fulfill all of our assistance obligations if all Member states um, commit to this. We um, did that in the um, production of microchip sector because we hardly have any of that production anymore. But a high share of um, machines that manufacture chips were transported and exported to um, Asia, where with our machines, um, chips were um, manufactured that were then exported to um, uh, Germany again. But in one decade from now, um, they will probably also be able to manufacture the machines, and then the entire know-how would have left um, 
Europe, and we have now a strategic cooperation together with the Netherlands and France, um, subsidized by money from the Commission. And if you look at um, Dresden, this led to um, new investments from Bosch and Global Foundries would also not be present in Dresden anymore if we hadn't supported this both um, financial and strategically. Now, the question is, um, should we do that for um, battery manufacturing as well, or do we also need it, need it in the field of artificial um, intelligence? As far as artificial intelli intelligence is concerned, I can say, yes, we have to work um, on that. As far as the promotion and um, funding of batteries is concerned, I don't know, because the automotive industry hasn't decided to demand that and um, superimposing something from the political side without the clear expressed um, desire is something um, strange. So we need to have clear signals here from the side of industry to really make headway here. Now, I already touched upon the issue of education. A lot needs to be done here, first and foremost, when it comes to educating those who are young and go to school now. I um, recently um, met with the winners of the Jugendforscht um, Championship, and um, when you ask them whether they're satisfied with the digital equipment in their schools, well, 2% um, say yes, but 98% of those present say no. So something needs to happen in that respect. And the most complicated aspect of this is probably that um, we have to quickly advance the further training of teachers, both um, vocational train, uh, vocational school um, teachers and um, grammar school teachers. Um, you can have a, an, an e-cloud, a learn cloud. You can hand out um, tablets, etc. as um, the legislators. But the thing then is you need to have the um, corresponding will, um, self-confidence, and um, participation of um, teachers. The um, universities and um, colleges of applied sciences will have to open up more um, to professions that correspond to the digital era. And when I see where we will have the most dramatic lack of skilled workers, it will be the IT sector. And I think we have to very clearly advertise these professions because IT questions cannot be outsourced. The um, security interests of um, medium-sized companies will lead to a situation where we need skilled people in the company instead of buying um, IT security abroad. And that's why this is one of the um, priority areas. And then there's the question of what does this mean when um, professions change? What does that mean from the vantage point of an employee at um, DHL, at Deutsche Post? Uh, for them, the blessings of being able to order via Amazon is something entirely different because they have to you know, park in the third um, lane and then go up four flights of stairs and then go down four flights of stairs and deliver somewhere where nobody's present, etc. So there's quite a lot of pressure. The question of how to take people on board will be one of the big tasks and it will only succeed if we succeed in creating a sufficient amount of jobs in Germany and in Europe in those professions where um, a lot of jobs will disappear and um, the Institute for um, Employment commissioned a study which says the total amount of jobs will not disappear, but the type of jobs will change. And now we're faced with two tasks. One is that we have to create an environment for these new developments, and this will be how to manage big data or big amounts of data. And the laws have to be in place so that this is not all outsourced um, with the data protection um, with the basic act or with the basic regulation on data protection we um, have made a first step in this direction there are still a lot of terms that are not defined and they hopefully will be defined without um, having to go to uh, court before that and when we had the last digital meeting in Ludwigshafen we thought whether Germany um, can develop together with um, the companies or also in a Franco-German approach some um, sample applications um, for this uh, regulation. So the one side is willingness and creativity and um, 
opportunities to turn big data into new applications, which will decide whether custom relations um, will um, prevail or not. And then um, to prepare manual blue-collar workers for new tasks in this um, new era, and the right conditions need to be in place for that. This is also one of the big tasks that we have. Without um, doing it in a way that's too centralistic or too rigid, when I say everybody has the right um, to further training, this doesn't necessarily have to be the right direction. I noticed that with the um, German reunification in the end, um, we had a lot of um, people working um, in the flower sector, but no people who, who had enough money to actually buy flowers. So this needs to be one of the big tasks where um, social partnerships also play a role. Now then I have the buzzword um, working hours that I heard. This is a very, very sensitive topic. We um, cannot have um, only self-employed people who are not bound by working hours at all. We need to have regulations regarding working hours that make sense when it comes to um, digital value creation. Personally, I always advocate for doing this together with the social partners and to have the so social partners involved in the digital industry as well, because without the social partners, um, life will become um, extremely difficult. If the elections turn out the way I want or we want, I will work with the corresponding um, industry associations very quickly to see how far they are willing to develop types of social partnerships in this field. Otherwise, there will be a very difficult time ahead of us, and we don't have the time to wage um, controversial battles in this respect because we need to um, advance. Now, with this, ladies and gentlemen, I focused very much on the economic side of it and not on the um, societal um, challenges. Um, those of us who need to go into election campaigns know how localized the um, offers from Facebook and other providers are when it comes to reacting to the individual wishes of um, citizens and um, voters and as political parties, um, we will be faced with um, challenges because every Wednesday night we um, have meetings with, I don't know, the um, fire um, fighters and we um, present the entire range of topics. This is something that young people aren't interested in anymore. They want, particularly young people, want to um, be addressed in uh, with regard to the individual concerns they have. And secondly, if customers are allowed to express their individual wishes um, everywhere, the question is how willing are we to find a consensus? I mean, this is going to become increasingly difficult. Um, well, two years ago, um, the um, party convention decided this and that is something that's still very far um, away. If you have to um, take a decision which is um, a lot closer and then when somebody says, you know, um, thank you very much, but um, two weeks from now I have my next um, round of meetings and I come back to my um, col uh, colleagues and um, discuss the issue and then feed back to you what the opinion is, that's also something that we no longer have um, because everything needs to be faster, everything's digitally available, it doesn't disappear, and then you don't have the opportunity of um, getting out of a promise you made because the um, Parliamentarians say, well, I said something else. I cannot explain to my um, constituents how, um, why and how I changed my opinion. So that's going to be a challenge for us as policymakers, but we'll have to see how we discuss this. Um, all in all, I think we can be grateful that we uh, live in times as interesting as these, but we have to make a little bit of um, an effort. Um, we have to base our thinking on the strong foundation of values that we were given by the social market economy. Um, it's not the case that the basic values um, upon which we decide have disappeared, and it's also not um, a fact that it's not um, man anymore who decides the direction of, uh, we want to take. But nonetheless, we have a lot to do also when it comes to creating a level playing field at the international level. So thank you very much for having organized this conference. Too bad that I couldn't be present throughout uh, the entire conference, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, very briefly, we've learned that we no longer need um, car drivers actors, but um, 
politicians and parliamentarians will be needed. And as we're still working on artificial intelligence in Germany, we will continue to use our own heads for um, this task of digitization. And it's not too late, but go faster is also something that we should remember. So a little faster so that we can advance this process. And as our colleague Mr. Fife has said, digitization begins in our minds. So enjoy the discussions and talks that you can have. Enjoy the rest of the day here in the German Bundestag. It's the last um, sitting week, and we'll see the constellations that we'll meet again this fall. Thank you.